الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن صار على نهجه واقتفى أثره إلى يوم الدين أما بعد so after praising Allah Azza wa Jal and sending salutations upon our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family and his companions, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. Jazakumullahu khaira. May Allah reward you with good. You gave your time and you made your effort to come to a house from the houses of Allah Azza wa Jal to listen to something beneficial bi-idhnillahi ta'ala of Islamic knowledge and wallahi this is from the best of the things you can spend your time in and it's from the things that wallahi if a person after the obligatory deeds had to choose a good deed to fill their time with even wallahi if somebody knew and you can't know but if somebody knew that they were going to die on this very day and the angel of death came to them and said to them that by this evening I'm coming for you. After their obligatory prayers and so on that they had to fulfill, there is nothing better that you could spend your time with than to learn beneficial knowledge and to implement it. And wallahi, I want to emphasize this particular point before we begin, even though we're going to emphasize it inshallah ta'ala during the explanation as well. That wallahi my brothers, Allah Azza wa Jal will not judge you based on the information you know. But he will judge you based on what you put into practice. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma wa wafiqna lil amali bihi. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us what will benefit us, to benefit us with what he teaches us. We ask Allah to increase us in knowledge. Say, my Lord, give me an increase in knowledge. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to practice it. And in this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I just want you to reflect. Because I want us to approach this sitting in the right way. I don't want us to come and give our time. And time is the most valuable thing you have. Ya bana Adam, innama anta ayyam. Fa'idha dhahaba yawmuk dhahaba ba'aduk. O son of Adam, you are just a few days. When one day goes, your life goes with it. A part of your life goes with it. So I don't want you to give your time and not benefit from it. So I want you to reflect upon the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Sumar. أَمَّنْ هُوَ قَانِتٌ آنَاءَ اللَّيْلِ سَاجِدًا وَقَائِمًا يَحْذَرُ الْآخِرَةَ وَيَرْجُ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّهِ قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ who is standing in obedience at night, making sajda, standing in qiyam, fearing the akhirah, hoping for the mercy of his Lord, say are those who know equal to those who don't know. The only people who will remember are those of understanding. Do you see how Allah described knowledge in the ayah? He didn't describe anything to do with how much information is in your head. He didn't say about the one who reads books all day or the one who memorized or the one who spends his time learning or listening. But at the end of the day, what you put into practice is what makes you a person of ilm, not the knowledge that is in your head. That's why a lot of people are, and you can say about them, the person's got knowledge and he's got some information. You can't say that person is a alim. And you can't say that person is a talib ilm. Because in reality, the actions don't match the information. So we want today to be a gathering of ilm. Beneficial Islamic knowledge. And we want today to be a gathering of something that we can put into practice. And that is why the topic that we have today, Wallah, is from the most beautiful of topics. The topic of... As-sayru ilallah 
والدار الآخرة. Traveling the journey to Allah Azza wa Jal. The journey to Allah and the Darul Akhirah. And if you think about this topic, I first of all, just before we start with the recitation of the poem, just let's, let's just think around the topic. Let's just kind of get an idea or orient ourselves, orientate ourselves as to what are we speaking about really. So I want you to think about it like this. The Prophets والسلام, came to their people with three fundamental things. They came to their people with three fundamental things. They came to teach people about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they came to show people the path to Allah in worshipping Him alone. And they came to tell you the rewards of the people who do so. These three things, all of them are in the title of the poem. This manzuma by Al-Allama Al-Si'di, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the teacher of Sheikh Ibn Thaymeen, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, one of the great scholars of modern times. Asayru ilallah, journeying to Allah. And at tariq at tariq ilallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the path to Allah? What is the sirat al mustaqim? What is the way that you're going on it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that path, what is the purpose of it? To know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To worship Allah Azza wa Jal. So the path to Allah Azza wa Jal is to worship Him alone. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ We only created the jinn and the men to worship me alone as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Dhariyat. That means that he's going to tell you about the path and that path is the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that path, it ends in knowing Allah Azza wa Jal and worshipping Allah based upon that knowledge. And it's the path to the Darul Akhirah. And the Darul Akhirah is the jaza the reward of the people who journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, يعني, some of them they call it manazilus salikin. That's a definite, sometimes they, they describe it like that, this topic. The way that you journey to Allah, the way that you gain knowledge of Allah, the way that you worship Allah upon goodness, the way that you come close to Allah and you journey in the right way towards the Dar al-Akhirah. And a number of scholars wrote on this topic. But in my view and the view of our mashayikh when they explain this book and this poem, the greatest book that has been written on this topic is the book of Al-Allama, Al-Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in three volumes, Madarij Al-Salikin. This is the topic that we're speaking about. And if you want to break it down into subjects, you can see there's a big element of tazkiyah in there. It's a big element of tazkiyah to nafs. Purifying yourself. Cleansing your soul. Building up your good deeds. Building your nearness to Allah. There's a big element of tazkiyah in there. There's a big element of tarbiyah. Of educating. In fact, this topic is often put under the title of a tarbiyah to islamiyah Nurturing you, teaching you, your teacher teaching you the right way to go about getting near to Allah and to go about this journey towards the Darul Akhirah. And it can also cover elements of aqidah, of belief, because knowing Allah is all about what you believe in Allah, it comes under al i'tiqad, and elements of al akhlaq, good manners. And good behavior. Good manners. Bear in mind the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا بُعِفْتُ لِأُتَمِّ صَالِحُ الْأَخْلَاقِ That's the riwayah Muslim Imam Ahmed. I was only sent to complete righteous manners. Outside of the Musnad, إِنَّمَا بُعِفْتُ لِأُتَمِّ مَمَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was only sent to perfect the most noble of manners. That means your manners has to include your manners with Allah Azza wa Jal. Not just your manners with creation. If you're thinking of manners as just how you treat your neighbor, that's a, that's a limited understanding. That's more, that's more narrow than what Islam gives you. In Islam, your manners, how are your manners with Allah? 
And from here is where the scholars said, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimullah ta'ala, he said, كان العلماء فيما مضى يكتبون بعضهم إلى بعض هؤلاء الكلمات. The scholars of the past used to write certain things to one another. And from the things they used to write, وَمَنْ أَصْلَحَ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ أَصْلَحَ اللَّهِ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ النَّاسِ Whoever corrects what is between them and Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will correct what's between them and what's between the people. So there's an element of akhlaq, there's an element of tarbiyah, there's an element of tazkiyatun nafs, purifying the soul, and there is an element of al-i'tiqad, al-aqeedah. It's also an element of, of understanding the fundamentals of worship, the concept of ibadah. So this is a really profound topic. And one of the great benefits that you have here, I'm going to give you two really great benefits of what we're going to study today. The first is that this poem is a small, easy to understand text. If we were to sit here with Madarij Salikin in three volumes, even to take pieces from it, it would be heavy on someone who's coming in their early days of, of learning about Islam would be a bit heavy on you. And there's some terminology in there that even sometimes the translators get it wrong. I remember looking at the translation uh, and seeing times where even the person who is studying the book didn't necessarily fully understand the way it's being presented and the terminology and things like that. So it's nice that it's summarized and it's inshallah ta'ala. I say inshallah because I never ever promise to finish. I've stopped promising to finish things because whenever I sit and I say, oh, it's easy, inshallah, we're going to finish this. It's only a few lines. We'll finish it inshallah ta'ala. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we'll finish the poem today. And that's a benefit because finishing things gives you a sense of confidence, gives you a sense of achievement by Allah's permission, helps you to go to the next step. The next benefit that I really want you to understand is that this poem is written by an imam of Ahli Sunnati wal Jama'ah. An imam whose aqeedah and practicing is in a line with the sunnah of the Prophet Why is that important? Because this topic, the topic of manazil as-sayr ilallahi subhanahu wa ta'ala and the topic of tazkiyatun nafs and things like that is a topic where a lot of the writing is not necessarily in accordance with the Sunnah. And from this, from the benefits Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala mentions in Dar Ta'arud al-Aql wa naql when he's criticizing some of the people of rhetoric for what they do and how they bring principles and rules and things that didn't Islam never came with. And you're bringing, you're telling people to follow things that you don't have evidence for. From the things that he criticized is people taking this subject and giving a fixed number of things a person has to learn or a fixed set of stages a person has to go through in a certain order with a certain number. He said, this person, they've brought upon themselves a burden that they don't have an evidence for. Because what happens is, you start saying to people, there's a thousand, you know, stopping points on the journey to Allah. This is the first one, this is the second one, this is the third one. There's no evidence for it. So to have an imam from Ahl Sunnah talk about this topic and summarize it for you is very valuable. Because he's going to keep away from some of the takalluf, the unnecessary burdening that came from the Sufiyyah and others when they put these, you know, pathways and systems in place for the journey to Allah Azza wa Jal and tarbiyah and tazkiyah nafs that didn't actually come from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And they actually burden the person with what they, they don't need. If a person says, my view, and Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, from the insaf of Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, from his justice, a very fair person, he didn't blame people. He said, you can say even what they said, you can say it from personal experience. That in my view, I think that, you know, a person should go through these phases and these steps. Like, and you can't make ilzam. You can't say to someone, this is your tariqah. This is your path and you step one, step two, step three. This is your, in, in developing your, you know, your heart and your connection to Allah. You can't make a person follow something that the Quran and Sunnah never came with. 
So it's very valuable that you have here a manvuma, a very small, very summarized poem written by a great scholar of Islam who is going to select for you what the Sunnah brings to us on this topic in a very, very summarized and easy to understand way, inshaAllah ta'ala. So how are we going to proceed today? Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, what I would like to do is we're going to ask our brother, Zawlaw Khairan, to read the poem for us in full. It's a nice short poem, it's not very long. And that's going to give us a little bit of a chance to listen, a little bit of a chance to think. You can follow in English or in Arabic, whichever you prefer. We'll read it in Arabic only, but you can follow in your notebooks. You can follow the, I think in the notebooks they have it in, in the English translation. One time. Then what we're going to do is go basically line by line with the Arabic and the English. And then we're going to do a, a gentle explanation. We're not going to try and you know, dive so deep that we all get lost and confused. But we have some really practical points that we can take home there are many explanations of this book or this poem. Uh, two explanations that I personally think that you should refer to, uh, that I tried to refer to as much as possible. Uh, the first is that the author himself, as Sa'di rahimullah ta'ala, sometimes they pronounce that you've seen it right in two ways, they pronounce it as Sa'di and as Sa'di. Allah knows best from what we understand from the Sheikh's family is that they pronounce it bi kasr uh, as seen with a kasr on the scene like and they write it with a fatha as well so and, he, and some of his students like that and some like that like in what i understand and allah azza wa knows best is that it should be as sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala uh, is that he himself wrote a commentary on the poem it's very short only i think 18 pages he just wrote ta'liqat he didn't write a, a sharh he just wrote some lit, some points he said, just bear this in mind, keep this in mind, this hadith in mind. He wrote some kind of like little notes on the, on, the, on the topic. So that's very good because always the author, you know, like they say, the people of Makkah know better what's in it, right? So the, the, the person who wrote the poem knows better about what he meant. So you can go back to that. And also there is a three hour, approximately three hour explanation uh, by our Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Razak al-Badr. Hafizahullah Ta'ala, which is audio. I didn't find it uh, written down, although I didn't check in a great deal of detail. But in audio, it's there. It's around about three hours long or so. And he goes through the, the poem and brings a lot of uh, beneficial points. So for those who have access to Arabic, I would recommend you read Sa'di's own commentary on the poem. And I'd also recommend you listen to our Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Razak Al-Badr, Hafizahullah Ta'ala in his explanation, and both of them are widely available online. It's not difficult to find, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, as for English, I have no idea if somebody explained it in English before. I'm not good. When you ask me about things in English, I'm not good at knowing what is there and what isn't, but you guys can search for it yourselves, inshallah. So, tafadhal akhi al-kareem, we'll begin with the recitation of the poem, inshallah ta'ala. alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. اللهم اغفر لنا ولشيخنا وللحاضرين ولجميع المسلمين الأحياء منهم الميتين قال الشيخ العلامة عبد الرحمن بن ناصر السعدي رحمه الله تعالى في منظومة السير إلى الله تعالى والدار الآخرة سعد الذين تجنبوا سبل الردى وتيمموا لمنازل الرضوان فهم الذين أخلصوا في مشيهم متشجعين بشرعة الإيمان وهم الذين بنوا منازل سيرهم بين الرجاء والخوف للديان وهم الذين ملأ الإله قلوبهم بوداده ومحبة الرحمن وهم الذين أكثروا من ذكره في السر والإعلان والأحيان يتقربون إلى المليك بفعلهم طاعة 
طاعاته والترك للعصيان فعل الفرائض والنوافل دأبوهم مع رؤية التقصير والنقصان صدر النفوس على المكاره كلها شوقا إلى ما فيه من إحسان نزلوا بمنزلة الرضا فهم بها قد أصبحوا في جنة وأمان شكر الذي أولى الخلائق فضله بالقلب والأقوال والأركان صاحب التوكل في جميع أمورهم مع بذل جهد في رضا الرحمن عبد الإله على اعتقاد حضوره فتبوأوا في منزل الإحسان نصح الخليقة في رضا محبوبهم بالعلم والإرشاد والإحسان صاحب الخلائق بالجسوم, و... بالجسوم وإنما أرواحهم في منزل فوقان ألا بالله دعوت الخلائق والمشاهد كلها خوفا على الإيمان من نقصان عزف القلوب عن الشواغل كلها قد فرغوها من سوى الرحمن حركاتهم وهمومهم وعزومهم لله لا للخلق والشيطان نعم الرفيق لطالب السبل التي تفضي إلى الخيرات والإحسان أحسن تبارك الله فيكم So with that we listen to the poem one time as we go through the poem, I'll point out where I have some differences in the nusakh, in the... In the uh, there are probably three, four places where there are some, some differences. An extra word here or a word taken out. And uh, I'll point those out, inshallah ta'ala, as we, as we go through them, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. So, as we've said, we've introduced the concept of the poem. This manzuma, which deals with a sayr. The journey to Allah Azza wa Jal and the Darul Akhirah. This idea, by, by the way, that when they talk about a sayr, it's a, it's a terminology that's used in this science. And sometimes people, terminologies can be tricky. And I'll tell you an example of how terminologies can be tricky. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim. Rahimullah ta'ala, based on the fact that he's commenting on a book that's already been written, he uses this terminology, a sayr, this journey. And this journeying is the journeying through life towards the Darul Akhirah in terms of your ibadah and you're getting near to Allah and, and those things. Why I mention this terminology is the word itself means journeying, right? fil art. Journey on the earth. It means to, to journey, particularly journeying at, uh, at night, but journeying on the earth. And sometimes when people read it written in the books, it confuses them, even Arabic speakers. Uh, so Ibn al-Qayyim in one place, I read in a translation, uh, he said something like, something like, by, by memory, approximately, he said something like, وَيُوَاصِلُونَ السَّيْرِ بَعْدَ صَلَاةِ الْفَجْرِ They keep going in this sayr after fajr. The translator wrote, they go for a walk after Fajr. He understood, and he, he understood what? That Sayyid here is like, they keep, they keep traveling, they keep, you know, they, they, they're on a journey, they keep going. Like in the Sayyid here is not a physical one, right? It's not about putting one foot in, in front of the other, or it's not about the idea of journeying in your car. This is the spiritual journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you see this word, a Sayyid, it's got nothing to do with a, a sefer or a journey that you are taking in terms of this world. It's not like traveling from, you know, Reading to, I don't know, London or somewhere else. Yani. This is about your spiritual journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a terminology that is used. So whenever they talk about this, as-sa'ireen, ilallah, and as that's what they mean. They mean this idea of that spiritual journey not the physical one. So it's a difficult, like I said, even really, really good yeah, and translators and people who explain, sometimes they miss that concept of the terminology, so keep that in mind. And 
keep in mind that the title gives us these three key points the prophets came with. Knowing Allah. What's the evidence that the prophets came with the purpose of teaching you about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who Allah is? The last ayah, Surah Al-Talaq. Allahu alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawati wa min al-ardi mithlahun yatanazzalu al-amru baynahunna li ta'lamu anna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir wa anna Allah qad ahata bi kulli shay'in ilma. Allah created the seven heavens. And from the earth, the like of them, his command goes between them, descends between them, so that you may know that Allah is able to do all things and that Allah has encompassed everything in his knowledge. So what does that tell you? That tells you that knowing Allah is one of the purposes for which Allah created the heavens and the earth. Don't neglect that. Don't think that knowing Allah is, is a bonus, any. As long as you do your salah and you give your zakah, knowing Allah is one of the fundamental reasons for which you exist on this earth. And it's one of the reasons why Allah created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in it for you to know Allah, His names, His attributes and His actions. And that is why if you think about it, Surah Al-Fatiha, what does it begin with? It begins with knowing Allah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm deen All of this is on the topic of coming near to Allah by knowing Him. But that knowing Him, is that enough by itself? It's not enough, right? Knowing Him requires a, a, a journey which is both spiritual and physical. And that journey is Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is the road of worship. You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. That is the sayr. That's what is intended by the sayr. You alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. That's, your, that's what your journey is. If someone asks you what path are you upon, what journey are you upon? What are you doing in this life to get close to Allah? That's the summary of it. You alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. And the evidence for this, We did not create the jinn and the men, Allah says, except to worship me alone. So now we understood that those two points, knowing Allah and the journey of worshipping him. Worship your Lord until death which is certain comes to you. You understood that this is a tawheed bi This is tawheed with its two types. You can make it three types, you can make it two types, no problem. Like in here for this discussion, for this discussion that we want, we want to talk about a tawheed bi Tawheed in its two types, that is Tawheed al-Ma'rifati wal-Ithbat and Tawheed al-Qasdi wal-Talab or Tawheed any al-Uluhiya al-Rububiya wal-Asma'u al-Sifat and on the other side Tawheed al-Ibadah or Tawheed al-Uluhiya. So the Tawheed, the oneness of Allah can be divided into two main things. The oneness of Allah as it relates to knowing Him and affirming what you know about him. Knowing him and affirming. What's, what's your job here? What is, what is required from you in this aspect is al-ma'rifah wal-ithbat. To know Allah, his names and attributes and actions and to affirm them. Not just to know them. You need to actually believe them and implement them in terms of your, what you know about them. So it, what is required is Al-Ma'rifah wal-Ithbat You know them and you affirm them That is what is required from you Tayyib The second aspect which is the actual journey of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That journey of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala What is required from you? Al-Ibadah Or Al-Amal Al-Qasd Your niyyah Your actions Your worship That's what's required from you so in the first type you're required to know and in the second you're required to 
act. If you want to think of it a different way, in the first type, you are required to declare Allah to be one in His actions. Because knowing Allah is all about Allah, His names and attributes and actions. It's not about what you do, it's about what Allah does. So it's saying nobody does what Allah does except Him. Does that make sense? And nobody creates except Allah, nobody gives life except Allah, nobody causes death except Allah, nobody sends down the rain from the sky except Allah, no one controls the universe except Allah, no one gives you a rizq except Allah. All of it is to do with what Allah does. And that no one does it but Him. As for Tawheed al-Ibadah, what is required from you is that your actions are only for Allah. Your worship. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَبِذَلِكَ أُمِرْتُ وَأَنَا أَوَّلْ مُسْلِمِ Say indeed, my living and my, say my prayer and my sacrifice and my living and my dying is for Allah, Lord of the worlds. So now your actions have to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ And in some of the ulama divided it into three where they took the first category and they split it into Ar-Rububiyyah and al asma Sifat. The Lordship of Allah, which is to do with Allah's actions and Allah's names and attributes. And there is no difference between the two. All of it is the same, the same concept. So this is about As-Sayr ilallah. As for Ad-Dar al-Akhirah, so here there are different aspects. Part of it is the aspect of Iman. Right, the aspect of believing in the Akhirah. And from this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Deen. That you believe in a deen, al jaza You believe that there will be a recompense for what you do. That you will be judged on this sayr that you're going on. This journey, this, this journeying through worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, through knowing Him and then building worship upon that knowledge you will be judged based on that. And that is the third aspect that the Prophets والسلام, came with to tell the people that you will be judged based on what? Your knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your worship of Him. And so if we bring all of that together, we can actually find it from, we could give for example the ayah in Surah Al-Mulk. الذي خلق الموت والحياة لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا The one who created death and life to test which of you is best in deeds. So Allah will test you with regard to your knowledge of Him and with regard to the worship that you build upon that knowledge. Now someone may ask a question and we'll conclude with this point. Someone may ask, what's the connection between those two things? Knowing Allah and worshipping Him. How do we bring them together? It's very simple. Knowing Allah leads you to worship Him. If someone asks you a question, why do you worship Allah alone? Why not worship a statue, or the sun or the moon, or the stars or the prophets or the angels? Why do you worship Allah alone? Your answer has to be something to do with what you know about Allah. Only Allah does this. Only Allah can help me. They can't benefit me. Only Allah can benefit me. Only Allah deserves to be worshipped because of and you're going to mention what you know of Allah. So now what that's going to tell us is the knowledge of Allah is going to drive you towards worshipping Him alone. And this you can see it in every ayah of the Quran when Allah Azza wa Jal mentions knowledge of Him, you will find in that context, in those ayat, in that passage, the command to worship Him. Look at the first command to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah. Ya ayyuhal nasu abudu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum wal ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun. O mankind, worship your Lord who created you and those people who came before you so you may become people of taqwa. And then, alladhi ja'ala lakum al arda firashan wa samaa abinaa. All of it is telling you about Allah's actions so that you Worship Him. You worship Him because you know that He's the Creator and no one else creates. You worship Him because He provided the earth and the heavens and the rain and no one else provides it except Him. So it drives you to worship Him. The worship of Him 
encompasses knowing him because you cannot worship what you don't know. If someone said, you worship Allah, okay, who is Allah? So if you don't know who is your Lord, you can't even pass the first question in the grave. Man rabbuk? What will the person say who is from those people who turned away from Islam? He will say, ah, 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 la adri. I, I don't know. If you don't know who your Lord is, you cannot worship what you don't know. And that's why Ibn al-Qayyim, he has a famous statement. Man kana billahi a'raf, kana minhu akhwaf, wa li'ibadatihi atlab, wa an ma'asiyatihi ab'ad. Whoever knows Allah more, worships Allah more, is more keen to worship Him. Fears Allah more, worships Allah more, and disobeys Allah less. Whoever knows Allah more, fears Allah more, and worships Allah more, is more keen to worship Allah and is further away from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't discount the value of knowing Allah and then worshipping Him based upon that and then realizing that your account, your jaza, your hisab on Yawm al -Din, the day of recompense, the day of al jaza, the day of where everybody will get the good or the bad of what they've done is based upon these things and that is beautifully encapsulated for us in the title Manzumatu As-Sayri Ila Allahi wa Dar al-Akhirah So we can inshallah ta'ala just go through maybe a couple of lines with the English as well inshallah ta'ala Assalamu alaykum Wa alaykum Sa'id al-lazina tajannabu subul al-rada wa tayammamu limanazil al-ridwani فهم الذين أخلصوا في مشيهم متشجعين بشرعة الإيمان. Happy are those who avoid the destructive paths and aim for the stations of Allah's pleasure, for they are the ones who were sincere and traversing the path whilst implementing the legislature of faith. أحسنت جزاك الله خيرا. I just want to point out, I said we'll mention if there are any ikhtilaf uh, and nusakh. Here, in my copy, I have the word qad. فَهُمُ الَّذِينَ قَدَ خَلَصُوا فِي مَشِيهِمْ This issue of al-urud uh, wal-qawafi might be beyond us today, of uh, measuring the poem and whether the poem is, is got the right balance, poetic balance or not. I don't really want to talk, I want to sit all day talking about poetic balance. Poetic balance is a hard subject and I'm not that great at it either. Um, there is a concept in Arabic to do with al-urud wal-qawafi which says that the poem has to be properly balanced and have the right kind of ending. And if it's not properly balanced on the right pattern, it's considered to be broken and then you, you like, it gets corrected. But the copy that I, the, the nuskha that I have has the word qad after it but I also have another one that doesn't for just it's worth noting any in in brackets that some of the some of the nusakh some of the scripts they have so we begin with a statement of al-nadhim rahimahullah ta'ala the poet rahimahullah ta'ala sheikh al-allama ibn sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala sa'id al-ladhina tajannabu Subul al-Rada Subul al-Rada Here He said Sa'idah These people They got a Sa'ada They got Eternal Happiness Happiness in this world And happiness in The Akhirah And that is Ultimately if you ask yourself, what does the word falah mean? What does the word success mean? The word falah, many times we hear, aflah al -mu'minun. The word falah is based around two key things. And a sa'ada, the idea of happiness. It's based around two key things, no more than that. And that is, nail al marghub and that you achieve what you are hoping for and you're saved from what you're scared of. That is the core of it. As in the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, 
فمن زحزح عن النار وادخل الجنه فقد فاز whoever is saved from the fire and entered into paradise that person has surely that person has surely been successful that person has surely been successful and this concept of as-sa'ada can be taken from the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla of, of achieving this eternal happiness from the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla wa amma alladhina su'idu fa fil jannati khalidina fiha ma damat as-samawati wal ard illa ma sha'a rabbuk ata'an ghayra majdhub in the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, in which he said, as for those who achieved their sa'ada, I'm just going to see if I can see the, uh, as for those who achieved this sa'ada, this happiness, they were the happy people. How do we know what they got? They're in Jannah. They're in Jannah. خالدين فيها they're going to be in it forever as long as the heavens and earth remain except for that which your lord wills this is a never ending gift from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what's the opposite of those people the people who didn't get a sa'ada who are they they're the people of shaqawa the people who are described as shaqi the people who are described as being the wretched in the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ شَقُوا فَفِي النَّارِ لَهُمْ فِيهَا زَفِيرٌ وَشَهِيقٌ وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ As for those people who are wretched, they didn't get this sa'ada. They will be in the fire and this fire, it has its, its sounds, its cry and its, the screams of its people the burning flames within it for the people who didn't achieve this happiness. So ultimately he starts by telling you this poem is telling you how from the ways, from the means that you can be from the people of yani, Ahlu Sa'ada fi dunya wal akhirah. And by the way, I, meant, I forgot to mention on the topic of the title the, an ayah which gathers together the whole concept which, you, which the Sheikh spoke about. There's an ayah in Surah Al-Isra that brings all of this topic. Yani the, the, the title the Shaykh gave can be taken from an ayah in Surah Al-Isra. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا Whoever wants the akhirah and strives for it, works for it, while being a believer, those people, their efforts are going to be appreciated. So what do we have in here? We have all the three points. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ The one who wants to journey to the Akhirah. They want to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the Dar al-Akhirah, to Jannah, to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise. That's what they want. But is it enough to want? لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا أَمَانِيَّ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا أَمَانِيِّ أَهَلْ الْكِتَابِ It's not your wishes, it's not what you want, it's not what Ahlul Kitab wants. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا You have to go and journey and work for it and go and journey and do sa'i, do efforts. And the sa'i contains the idea of journeying and it contains the idea of working hard. وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ Believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his names, his attributes and his actions and the actions which come out of what you know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of that is part of your iman. Those people, their efforts are going to be appreciated. So that you can link that to the title as well. So going back to what the Nadim said, he said, Sa'id al-ladhina tajannabu subul al rada Notice he said they keep away from the paths of any of the paths. What did we have in the translation for it? 
the destructive paths. In arrada is everything which is is is, is not uh, is not praiseworthy, that which is lowly, that which is wretched, that which is of no value. So these destructive paths. Here, he points out a nadim, rahimahullah ta'ala rahmatan wasi'a, something very valuable. The journey to Allah has only one path. As for the journey following the desires and the shayateen, that has many paths. What's the evidence for that? The statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ This is my straight path. So follow it. This is the Prophet ﷺ now is, is now being told to tell, to recite the Qur'an. Allah's straight path is one. اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ and don't follow all of the other paths. Don't follow all of the other paths. فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ Every other path is going to take you away from the one path that leads to Allah. What path is that? That path is the path described by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ Guide us to the straight path. So this path, it has a beautiful thing about it. The path itself is straight. It's straight. The Prophet ﷺ said about it, لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا لَا يَزِيغُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا هَالِكَ Its night is like its day, no one deviates from it except that they will be destroyed. You're never going to miss it. It's not like a, a one of these roads when you're... You know, I walked to the masjid today. I walked past the masjid. Even though I knew where the masjid was. While I walked past the masjid, I reached the end of the road. And then we walked back and we found the masjid again. It's not like that. It's not a road where you can get lost. It's very, very clear. It's straight. It's easy to know. You don't have any doubt about it. It's night is like it's day. The other benefit of this straight path is that it is the path of the people of istiqamah. The people who say our Lord is Allah and then they stand upright as upright Muslims. It's a path of upright Muslims. So who are these upright Muslims? فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا This is the path of the people that Allah gave His blessings to. And Allah here, تفسير القرآن بالقرآن Allah tells us in the Qur'an who these people are. No one is allowed to change what Allah said about who these people are. They are النبيين, the prophets. As-Siddiqeen, those people who are at the highest stage of truthfulness in their iman. Like Abu Bakr radiallahu an, And al-Shuhada, the martyrs. The likes of Umar, and Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhum. And the Salihin, the righteous. And here we're going to bring in another point, which is who can we definitively say is righteous? And who could I say, I could swear by Allah, Wallahi, this person was righteous, Wallahi, this person is in Jannah. But only the one that Allah said it about them. Which group of people did Allah say this about? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum. وَكُلًّا وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى All of them Allah promised paradise. رَضِيَ anhum wa an. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. This now tells us that the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the path of the prophets. The only way you can purify yourself to be from the people of Sa'ada, the people of eternal happiness, is to follow the way of the prophets alayhim salatu And to follow the way of the sahaba. 
the Siddiqeen and the Shuhada and the Salihin that Allah testified to their truthfulness of their Iman and Allah testified to the martyrdom of those who were martyred among them and Allah testified to the righteousness of the righteousness among them. Everybody else, Allahu A'lam. We don't have a, we have a, we, we have raja, hope for them. And we hope that Allah accepts from them. But a dalil that Allah has accepted their deeds that we have for the Sahaba. So the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, those are the people that we need to be following after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in this journey. Every other path that takes you away from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his sunnah and the Sahaba and what they implemented from it, this is from Subul al-Rada, the wretched, deviant, evil paths that take you away from the path of Allah. And from the evidence of this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِحِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا Whoever opposes the messenger after guidance came to them and follows a way other than the way of the believers. Who were the believers when the ayah came down? The Sahaba. We will give him to take what you chose for yourself. And we'll put him in Jahannam and what an evil destination. So opposing the Prophet ﷺ and opposing the Sahaba, this is from the paths of destruction, which takes you away from Allah. It doesn't bring you close. You cannot get near to Allah except with what the Prophet ﷺ brought. Man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fahuarad. Whoever does an action which is not in accordance with what the Prophet ﷺ brought his command, his sunnah, it will be rejected from them. How sincere, hadith wala haraj, how sincere they are. But wallahi will not be accepted from them until they do it the way the Prophet ﷺ did it. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ one day, he took a stick in the sand he drew a line. And from this line he drew khutut. Yaminan shaman. Like to shimalan, yaminan And he drew on the right hand side and the left hand side in the sand. Lines coming off. And he recited This is my straight path. Follow it and don't follow the other paths. He said on the corner of every path is a shaitan calling the people. You think shaitan says Jahannam this way? The sign doesn't say that. The sign says this way for ibadah, this way to get as a shortcut, this way will make you near to Allah, this way feels good, this way you can repent later. Shaitan doesn't write a sign and say Jahannam this way. Nobody would follow it. He gives you two things to send you astray. He gives you shahawat and shubuhat. Desires, oh this way looks really good and I know it's wrong, I know it's wrong, I know it's not going the right way, I know the straight path is there and I know it's there but it feels really good. Let's just see, let me just go down that path five, ten minutes and then I'll come back again. Shahawat. Or shubuhat, confusion. What confusion does he give you? He tells you this is the faster path to Allah. No, 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 this straight path, everybody goes down there. This takes a long time. Come this way, it's faster. So either he takes you with this or with that, bringing it back to Surah Al-Fatiha, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ Don't put me on the path of Al-Maghdubi alayhim. The Prophet ﷺ described Al-Maghdubi alayhim and al to be Al-Yahud and Nasara, the Jews and Christians. But why? It's the question, why? What made them the people Allah is angry with and the people who went astray? Why did Ahlul Kitab become like that? The first group were misguided by their desires, shahawat. They knew what they're doing is wrong. If you asked them and said, is this not against the Torah? They would say, bala, it is. What I'm doing, I know it's against the Torah. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. 
So that's why Allah's anger came upon them. The other people you said, is that not against the Injil? They said, what Injil? What's that? Did Allah say something in the Injil? They don't know what's right, what's wrong. They don't have any idea. They worshipped Allah upon jahl, ignorance. So one got confused by their knowledge, lack of knowledge and the other one got confused by the lack of action. And that's why, and again, we might be on here all day so we'll have to go a bit quickly. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet with what? He is the one who sent his messenger with Al Huda wa Deen Al Haq. What is Al Huda? Al Ilm Al Nafi'. Deen Al Haq, Al Amal Al Salih. Beneficial knowledge, righteous actions. Righteous actions without beneficial knowledge, La Infaruk. It's not going to benefit you. Just like it didn't benefit the Nasara. This monasticism they invented, they became monks. Allah never told them to do it. They just made it up. That's not going to benefit you. Making up your own ibadah. That's not going to benefit you. And likewise, having knowledge and not practicing it is going to bring Allah's anger upon you like it became upon Ahl Kitab. So this tells us what he's telling us now. Keep away from. And I love the word here, tajannabu. Keep away from it. He didn't say, and it's not just about not going down that path. It's about not going near to what goes down that path. Like in the hadith of an numan ibn Bashir, radiallahu anhuma, in which the Prophet said, إِنَّ الْحَلَالَ بَيِّنٌ وَإِنَّ الْحَرَامَ بَيِّنٌ وَبَيْنَهُمَا أُمُورٌ مُشْتَبِهَاتٌ لَا يَعْلَمُهُنَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنَ النَّاسِ the halal is clear, the haram is clear. Between them there's some grey areas, not many people know. Some people know, but not many people know. What's the right way, what's the wrong way? So whoever keeps away from the grey areas has saved his religion with Allah and his honour with the people. And whoever falls into the grey areas has certainly fallen into the haram. Tajannabu, keep away from anything that will lead you to something that will lead you to something that will lead you to one of these paths. That's why people say, you know, Muslims are a bit strict. You know, your things like, you don't you say, really, do we need to have the women separate and the men separate? And all of this is about tajannub. Subul al rada keeping away from anything that might lead us to something that might lead us to a path that would take us away from the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then he tells us, and you just give me the translation for that. Info, okay, tam. وَتَيَمَّمُ لِمَنَازِلِ الرَّدْوَانِ مَنَازِلَ الرِّدْوَانِ You want to aim for the stations, the position of Allah's pleasure. You want to aim for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What am I thinking of? I'm thinking of the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. I'm thinking of the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah At Tawbah. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِ مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خالدين فيها ومساكن طيبة في جنات عد ورضوان من الله أكبر ذلك هو الفوز العظيم. This is a very profound ayah. Allah has promised the believing men and the believing women. That means belief as in the belief that comes, the aspects of knowledge and aqidah and the belief that is practiced, the actions that are done. The believing men and the believing women. Jannat gardens under which rivers flow, they will be there forever. And a beautiful dwelling in Jannati Adan, in Allah's paradise. And then what did Allah say? وَرِضْوَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ Allah's pleasure is greater than all of that. For Allah to be pleased with you, and to confirm for you that you will never be punished after that 
Wallahi, it is greater. وَرِضْوَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ That is what it means to be truly successful. So it's not just, we're not just aiming. And the manazil, what did he say? Manazil here. It tells us that it's not just one place. Jannah is not of all one level. The goals and the station that you can reach of ubudiyah, of worship of Allah in this life is not one level. People are not all the same. It's not like Muslim, not Muslim. Within the believers, there are darajat. Between some of these levels are what is between the heavens and the earth. In the difference between the people. Aim for the stations, the positions, which are the lofty status. And they come together with all of the aspects of Iman. Not just what you believe. What you believe and what you practice. What you do with your tongue and what you do with your limbs and what you do with your heart. All of it comes together. And what you can achieve, the levels that a person can achieve, the highness, the, the status in the sight of Allah that a person can achieve, that is what you're aiming for. Don't aim for to be the last person in the door. Don't say, I just want to be the last people from the per person from the people of Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا سَأَلْتُمُ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةِ فَسَلُوهُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ If you ask Allah for Jannah, ask Him for Al-Firdaus. Ask Him for the highest place of Jannah. Some of the narrators said, I think the Prophet ﷺ said that, and he said, for sure, he said, that Al-Firdaus is A'la Al-Jannah. It is the highest place in, in paradise. al Jannah, And it's the best place in paradise. وَمِنْهُ تَفَجَّرُ أَنْهَارُ الْجَنَّةِ And the rivers of Jannah flow from it. Some of the narrators say, and I believe he said, and above it is the throne of the Most Merciful. وَرِدْوَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ And for Allah to be pleased with you and never to punish you after that moment ever again, this is greater and greater. This is success from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَهُمُ الَّذِينَ قَدْ أَخْلَصُوا فِي مَشِيهِمْ The first thing that he mentions about this journey to Allah. Here, al-mashi, it doesn't mean they're walking, right? We, we, we said, remember, the asayr and al-mashi and all of that, the words like walking and journeying and traveling, it means your journey to Allah on the sirat al-mustaqim. Is with ikhlas. Because wallahi, our religion, the fundamental pillar of our religion is sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ امْرِئٍ مَّا نَوَى Actions are according to intentions and everyone will have the reward of what they intended. Everything comes back to your intention. Along with what? What we mentioned. Following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, because if you don't follow the sunnah, it doesn't get accepted. And if your intention is not right, it doesn't get accepted. Intention is meant by two things. One of them is intended here and one of them is, is not. By intention, when we say niyyah, we can mean the issue of ikhlas, i.e. who are you doing this effort for? Your sa'i, your efforts, your hard work, who is it for? Is it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is it for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is what is intended here, al-ikhlas. And also an niyyah can be used for distinguishing between the different type of ibadat or distinguishing between worship and customs and things like that. That's not intended here. What's intended by the ikhlas here is the ikhlas that every single action you do, every act of worship that you do is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And that's why as Sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala in his own explanation he begins with a discussion of ibadah what is ibadah And from the things that is said about ibadah ibadah is has a number of different definitions But from the definitions of ibadah all of them give you something So you need to understand something it's a little faida and we always telling people definitions are not a precise science Be careful about that when people define things if it's not defined in Quran and Sunnah, if it's just scholars defining things, it's not necessarily daqiq, very precise. 
actually sometimes people just give you examples of things and it's li taqrib al fahmi they they try to help you to understand but they're not necessarily drawing a border for you in everything later on the scholars tried to do that and they talked about it being jami' mani and you know you have to everything has to go inside and all of that but actually definitions can be sometimes you have to bring a few together to understand something so let me give you the definition of Sheikh Islam Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala for ibadah so we know what is meant by this mashi and this journeying. He said, Ismun jami'un li kulli ma yuhibu Allah wa yarda min al aqwali wal a'mal al zahira wal batina. It is a comprehensive term for everything that Allah loves and is pleased with, from statements and actions, whether internal or external. Everything Allah loves and is pleased with. Whether something you say or something you do, whether something in your heart, like the beliefs of the heart, or something you do with your heart, or something you say with your tongue or you do with your tongue, or something that you do with your limbs, those are the five parts of Iman, right? What you say with your heart is your aqidah. What you do with your heart, like loving Allah and hoping in Allah. What you say with your tongue in terms of the shahadatain. And what you do with your tongue like dhikr and reciting the Qur'an And what you do with your actions Whether internal or external All of that is It has to be only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ikhlas in all of it It's worth Mentioning also the definition of Al-Allama al-Mu'allimi Rahimahullah ta'ala where he said, خُضُوعٌ اِخْتِيَارِي يُرْجَى مِنْهُ نَفْعٌ غَيْبِي It's also a very good definition. He said, it is a voluntary act of submission. And it's an act of submission and surrender. That you do voluntarily seeking a benefit from the unseen. So it is an act of voluntary submission by which you seek a benefit from the unseen. And all of those have ma'akhid and points and you know you can take from this one and add from this one and this one doesn't include this and this one. That's not, the idea is we understood we've got a good idea now what is meant. In all of this, it has to be sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And then he brought the second condition. Mutashari'ina bi shir'atil imani. That they have sincerity and what do they have? They're following the sharia, the shir'a, the shir'a, the sharia, the, the system, the laws, the rules, the regulations set out by Allah and sent down and conveyed to us by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he joined between what? He joined between the two conditions for every action to be accepted. Al-Ikhlas wal-Mutaba'ah. Sincerity and following the sunnah of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's because every single ummah has its own sharia. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجًا Every single nation we made for them a set of rules and laws and regulations to follow. We made for them their laws and their, their method of following them and their way of following them. Every nation. So our sharia is different to the sharia. In, the, the, the de in its detail, it's different to the sharia or the shara'i that came before, right? As for the deen itself, it's not, it's not different, right? The, the usul and the i'tiqad It's the same from Adam, Ibrahim, Nuh, Isa, yani Musa alayhim salatu wassalam, They had the same beliefs And they had the same religion But where they differed are in some of the rules and regulations and laws Every ummah was given its own So are we allowed to come near to Allah by being sincere to him And following the religion of Musa I mean, As in the laws, the individual laws of Musa no. The Prophet ﷺ said, if Musa was alive, he would have no choice but to follow me. Because every sharia that came abrogated the sharia that was given before. 
So in terms of the deen, the religion is Islam. Islam is the religion of the angels before Adam. As Ibn al-Qayyim said, Rahimullah ta'ala in his Nuniya, Islam is the religion of... Not Ibn al-Qayyim said it. It was al-Qahtani, I think it is Nuniya said it. That it was the religion of the angels before Adam. It was the religion of Adam and it is the religion of Muhammad وسلم, and it is the religion of the Muslims today. This is Islam. But the Sharia, the individual laws and the regulations, you have to follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's, if you don't follow, it's not accepted. So he brought sincere intention and following the Sunnah. And if you bring these two things, this is what your Mashi, your Sayyir is built upon. And this is from the beautiful things that he brought you now. He brought you the correct view of Ahl Sunnah with regard to a Sayyir ila Allah. The Ahl Sunnah say a Sayyir to Allah, it does not benefit without two things. Sincerity and following the Sunnah. If you do that, then your Sa'i, your efforts and your Sayyir and your journeying and your worship, it will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I might just go off on a tangent. So when it comes to the type, the we have? Okay, Bismillah, recite, and we'll at least hear the recitation a little bit, and I can start start talking about it, inshallah. Zakallah <laughs> khairan. Sallallahu alaykum. Wa humu alladhina banaw manazil sayrihim bayna al-raja wal-khawfi lil-dayyani. And they are the ones who built the stations of their journey between hope and fear of a dayyan Allah is beautiful what he said. He's giving you usul. He's giving you principles before he's giving you details. Before he talks to you about akhlaq and, and before he talks to you about the perfection of worship, let's get the fundamentals. The fundamentals of ikhlas and mutaba'ah and the fundamentals that your your sayr, your journey is between two fundamental actions of the heart. And they are al-khawf wal raja fear and hope. The evidence for this in Surah Al-Anbiya, this is one of the evidence, there are many evidence. But Surah Al-Anbiya, from the evidences, by the way, Surah Al-Fatiha. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm din That's from the evidences. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim is an ayah of hope in Allah. We hope in Allah. We want what is with Allah, Allah's mercy. And when you hear about Allah's mercy, Wallahi, you feel that nobody will ever go to Jahannam. When you hear the vastness, the Prophet saw a woman. She was among the prisoners and, and when she found she was going to any child and she would look for her child and when she took it, she would took that child and put it onto her chest. The Prophet said, do you think this woman would throw her own child into the hellfire? They said, no, by Allah, if she was able to prevent herself in any way from doing that, she would never put her own child into the fire. The Prophet ﷺ said, Lallahu arham. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more merciful than this woman to her child. When you hear the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you feel that no one will go to the fire. But when you hear about the punishment of Allah, Allah is sari'ul hisab, shadeedul iqab, shadeedul adab, severe, swift in punishment, dhun tiqam. Allah takes retribution. La yuraddu ba'suhu anil qawmin mujrimin. His torment and punishment cannot be repelled from the criminal people. Wallahi, you feel like maybe nobody will go to Jannah. The Prophet mentioned that a person could say a word, he doesn't even think about it. It takes him into Jahannam, Sabarina Khalifa. 70 years deep. He said one word came out of his mouth. He didn't even think about it. It never even came into his mind that he did something wrong. 70 years he falls into Jahannam. Maliki Yawmid Deen. You get scared. Very scared. From the evidences of this, and we won't take too long, so we just have a couple of minutes. From the evidence of this is the statement. Of Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Anbiya after mentioning many of the Anbiya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the Noon, Yunus, and he mentioned Zakaria when he said, Rabbi la tadarni fardan wa anta khayru warithin. 
إنهم كانوا يسارعون في الخيرات ويدعوننا رغبا ورهبا وكانوا لنا خاشعين They used to rush to do good deeds So that what do we have there? السير إلى الله السعي The journey to Allah They were journeying, they were rushing, they were always moving Doing good deeds ويدعوننا رغبا ورهبا They called upon us in fear and hope وكانوا لنا خاشعين And they were in a state of submissiveness and humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They called upon us in raghaban wa rahaba, hope and fear. And that's how the prophets were. So let nobody say that fear and hope is, you shouldn't have hope and fear. Like some of the Sufiya, they said that. They said, we don't worship Allah out of hope and fear. We only worship him out of love. We see this is deficient. Adhanaqis. Because the prophets used to worship Allah alayhim salatu wasalam upon love and hope and fear. And all three came in Surah Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The tarbiyah of Allah. The love that you have for what Allah has given you. And the mercy of Allah that encourages you to hope. And the recompense which makes you fear. And here, As-Sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala mentions something very important and that is the name of Allah Azza wa dayyan the one who will take everyone to account. That name, ad dayyan the one who will take every single person and who will give the reward to those who did good and who will give the punishment to those who did bad, that tells you something. That's a name that inspires fear. So it's like he's saying, think about the ayah, Maliki Yawmiddin, the fear you get, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the hope that you get, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen The love that you have for Allah Ibn Al-Qayyim described it like this The head of a bird with two wings The love of Allah is what motivates you If you think about it Love is a great motivator In fact you could argue that love is the greatest motivator In driving you forward You love Allah You don't love anyone with the love that is for Allah It's only for Allah وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادَيْ يُحِبُّونَهُمْ from among the people are those who took rivals besides Allah they love them like they love Allah but those who believe love Allah more that love is there it has to be there that love is what motivates you and keeps you going forwards it's the head of the bird but you have to stay balanced when you're moving you can't fall over on one side you can't fall over on the other if you have too much hope, what will happen? Become lazy. Allah Kareem. Allah is forgiving, yeah? Allah is generous. Never mind, we'll just do all the sins. Allah Kareem. If you have too much fear, you'll despair. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say, O oh my servants who have transgressed against themselves, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Allah forgives all sins. So you balance yourself. Not too much fear, not too much hope. Last point on this, inshaAllah ta'ala. In your lifetime, which of them should be given precedence? Fear or hope? Which one of them do you weigh down more? The scholars here, they say, some of them said they're exactly even. Like in, there's a view that says that fear should be given more weight when you are healthy and you have your youth and your energy and so on that you should give, you need to have more weight on fear. Because that is what pushes you and drives you forward. And that's what gets you to keep going and trying and striving and using your energy and your health and your youth and all of that. But if you become sick, or you find yourself slowing down and you find yourself struggling and you're burning yourself out, here you should give an increase in hope because that is when you... Uh, and you burnt yourself out. And for example, a person before the moment of death, to be honest, fear at that moment doesn't benefit you, right? There's nothing left for you to do except have the good deed of hoping in Allah. And as my slave thinks of me, as, as in the hadith Qudsi. So it is a balance. It's not only fear, because that leads to despair, but it's about a balance that is slightly inclined towards fear when you are 
healthy, when you are young, when you're energetic, and that when you feel yourself slipping or you're sick and you're struggling, that it's balanced towards, with us, towards the idea of hope and particularly before the moment of death. That, inshallah ta'ala, very, very summarized, brings us to the end of the third line. Um, my experience is usually we speed up, but let's see, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, um, we could actually mention, to be honest, we just read the last line just, as a, just to read it because we, are also mention, we should also mention the next line, which we've already explained as well. Naam. And they are the ones whose hearts the deity Allah filled with love of him and love of Ar-Rahman. So here, as we said, he brought the third aspect, which is between fear and hope, and your heart is full of love. And that's how the prophets used to be. Alayhim salatu wasalam. That makes sense? Heart is full of love of Allah, balance between fear and hope, adjusting according to the circumstances you go through in your life. And that is an asal min usul as sayyid ilallah. It's a principle. And that's from the beauty of this poem that it begins with the fundamentals and then goes into the individual actions. And that is from the, I mean, the fact that the author, rahimullah ta'ala, is alimu rabbani is a nurturing scholar. He's teaching you the fundamentals first and then taking you into the individual issues. Hada wallahu alam. Wassalatu wassalamu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala abdillahi wa rasulih nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. I want to read you something that Sa'di rahimullah ta'ala said in his own explanation regarding the love of Allah Azza wa Jal before we move on to the fifth line. He said, وَمَعْنَ الْمَحَبَّةِ تَعَلُّقُ الْقَلْبِ بِالْمَحْبُوبِ وَلُوزُومُ الْحُبِّ لِلْقَلْبِ فَلَا تَنْفَكُ عَنْهُ وَهِيَ تَقْتَضِي مِنْ صَاحِبِهَا الْإِنْكِفَافِ عَمَّا يَكْرَهُهُ الْحَبِيبِ وَالْمُبَادَرَةِ إِلَى مَا يُرْضِيهِ بِقَلْبٍ مُنْشَرِحِ I think what he said, Wallahi, this is very, very powerful. He said the meaning of love is for your heart to be attached to the one that you love. You all know the famous line of poetry. There was a poet called Majnoon Layla. It was called the person who became mad because of Layla. And he said his famous line of poetry, he said, مَرَرْتُ بِالْدِّيَارِ دِيَارِ لَيْلَىٰ أُقَبِّلُ ذَا الْجِدَارَ وَذَا الْجِدَارَ مَا حُبُّ الْدِّيَارِ شَغَفَنَّ قَلْبِ وَلَكِنْ حُبَّ مَنْ سَكَنَ الْدِّيَارَ He said, I walked around the house, the house of Layla, kissing this wall and that one. He said, it wasn't the love of the wall that has engulfed my heart, but the love of the one who lives inside the walls. The point is the heart becomes completely devoted to the one that you love. This we're talking about here, we're talking about, by the way, the love of ibadah. Here we're talking about the love because all our discussion is on ibadah. So that the complete, the heart is completely devoted to the one that it loves. And that love does not separate from that heart at all. It is permanent, a permanent feature of that heart. What does this mean? It means that you keep away from everything that the one that you love dislikes. That's why you see, if you see someone like Majnoon Layla, someone who lost his mind over a woman, what do you see, subhanAllah? You see that this person... Everything she likes, he starts to like. Everything that she tells him she doesn't like, he changes the way he dresses, he changes the way he eats, he changes his habits. This is in the love of the dunya. What do you think about the mahabba that is ibadah? Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, you love it by default. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates, 
your life is about doing what will make Allah pleased with you because of how much you love Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does that mean? It means you rush to do what He loves with a heart that is munsharih. It's, it's satisfied. It is, and it doesn't feel pressure. You don't feel compelled. You don't feel like it's a horrible thing that you have to pray and you have to... Your heart feels satisfied and happy and content because you're doing what the one who you love will be pleased with. And your chest is in a state, you, you, you welcome it. You, you love doing what Allah loves. He said, فَإِن تَكَلَّمَ تَكَلَّمَ بِاللَّهِ وَإِن سَكَتَ سَكَتَ لِلَّهِ وَإِن تَحَرَّكَ فَلِلَّهِ وَإِن سَكَنَ فَلَهِ He said, when he speaks, he speaks for the sake of Allah. And when he's quiet, he's quiet for the sake of Allah. When he moves, he moves for the sake of Allah. And when he's still, he's still for the sake of Allah. The love of Allah has taken over every action that he does. And what comes out from it, you crave, you long to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You long, you don't feel... Rested in this dunya. And that's why you are mina sa'irin from the people on a journey. You can't keep your feet still because you don't feel satisfied. This is not where you want to be. You are far from the one that you love. And when you're far from the one that you love, the only thing that is in your mind is to get closer and closer and nearer and nearer to the one that you love. So you don't feel settled in this dunya. You just crave the day that you can look upon the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then what is the way he said? What is the way and the means to get that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهَ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Wallahu ghafoor rahim Say if you really love Allah Then follow the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah will love you And Allah will forgive your sins If you want the love of Allah Azza wa Jal The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Comes from following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa ala ahli wa sahbihi wa sallam Naam tafadhal akhil kin Hassanallahu alaykum Qala al-shayh rahimahullahu ta'ala وهم الذين أكثروا من ذكره في السر والإعلان والأحيان. Again here in this اختلاف النسخ. In my نسخة I have I have two and both of them came from the sheikh as far as I know. يعني this one it came from the sheikh by way of one of his students بالإجازة. Not my إجازة but the person who wrote it wrote it from the, a copy from the sheikh by his ijazah and the other one came from the printed writing of the sheikh himself but there's both of them like in this one also has the word qad وَهُمُ الَّذِينَ قَدْ أَكْثَرُوا مِنْ ذِكْرِهِ فِي السِّرِّ وَالْإِعْلَانِ وَالْأَحْيَانِ here he talks about one of the manazil manzilatun sharifa one of these Stages and phases and positions and, and the actions that bring you near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and bring you forward in your journey And that is the desperate need of a person to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And in reality if you, relate, if you relate this to what we said about the love of Allah Then if you truly love Allah and you long to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you would find that your tongue cannot last long without remembering the one that you love. And this remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only does it fill your time with what is beneficial, not only is it an easy ibadah. You think of some of the ibadat that have mashaqqa in them. We don't say they have 
illa We don't say taklif. I don't like that word. That it's like a, a burden on you. But there are some elements of mashaqqa. That's interesting. Lil fa'ida. And here is a fa'ida. Sa'di himself brings it in his Manzumat al Qawaid al Fakiya. His poem on al Qawaid al Fakiya. That the Sharia didn't come with the word Raf'ul Mashaqqa. It didn't come with the word of removing anything which is difficult from your ibadah. But it came with Raf'ul Haraj and Raf'u al Ta'asir, al Usr. Taking away al Usr and taking away al Haraj. But it didn't, the word Mashaqqa, I mean, ibadat, like if you get up for Fajr and you come and it's cold, it's a little, it's, it can be a little bit tough. Yani. But it's not a burden, it's not a hardship, it's not something which is. It's not something which is impossible for you to do or which is extremely painful for you to do. يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر. Allah wants things to be easy for you. He doesn't want things to be difficult. The reason I discuss this whole, that whole any side point is that ibadat can have <coughs> a certain amount of difficulty in them. And that doesn't go against the principle that al-mashaqqa tajlibu taysir that hardship brings about ease. That doesn't contradict it. There can be a certain amount of challenges in an act of worship. But the dhikr of Allah is from the easiest of the acts of worship that a person can do. And that is why when a man said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna shara'i al-islami qad kathurat, inni qad kathurat alayhi, فَأَوْصِنِي O Messenger of Allah The laws of Islam are many So command me <clears throat> This is from the beautiful questions That the Sahaba radiallahu anhum used to ask he's, he's not saying I want to leave praying I want to leave zakah He's saying there's a lot of things to think about So focus me on something Give me something that I can Focus on and I can, you can give me an instruction that I can be careful to do it among all of the other things that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to pray and give zakah and hajj and fasting. So tell me what can I focus upon? The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزال لسانك رطبا من ذكر الله أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم Do not let your tongue stop being moist. Don't let your tongue dry out. From the remembrance of Allah. Keep yourself constantly. Just like if you don't drink water, your tongue will become, will become dry, right? Don't let your tongue dry out from the dhikr of Allah. Rather, more than you drink water, you should remember Allah. And your need for remembering Allah is greater than your need for food and drink. So you remember Allah as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayuhaladina amanudkuru Allah dhikran kathira wa sabbihuhu bukratan wa asila. O you who believe, remember Allah with much remembrance. In fact, if we were to just stop and talk about the ayat of the Quran that talk about dhikr, we would finish the whole session. We would not be able to get beyond the session for Maghrib without talking about the ayat alone that talk about the virtue of dhikr. The greatest of dhikr is the book of Allah. The greatest of dhikr is the book of Allah. And the person who makes themselves busy with the Quran has achieved the greatest of the rewards of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it should be done much. It's not just that you remember Allah sometimes, you remember Allah when you need something. But the Muslim is constantly engaged in remembering Allah. And it's really beautiful that Imam al-Sa'idi rahimahullah ta'ala began these instructions with something that is easy for everyone to do. No one can say I'm too busy to remember Allah. You can be in the bakery, like that famous story of the man with Imam Ahmed. You can be in the bakery, just baking your bread and making istighfar. 
You can be yani, doing any of your work, any job, and just, you know, even if your job is on the phone, every time you put the phone down and you say, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, La ilaha illallah, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, Astaghfirullah, and you're constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't require a lot of effort. It's not very hard to do. It doesn't require necessarily that you have to be in a state of wudu or that you have to be in the masjid or... Oh, that it is something the Prophet ﷺ used to remember Allah in every situation. And that's why he said, In every heen, in every moment, in every hal, the Prophet ﷺ used to remember Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ never went through a situation where he stopped remembering Allah. Bearing in mind there are situations where you cannot pray. For example, Halat al Janaba, if you're in the state of Janaba, there are situations where Yani according to some of the views, you can't recite the Qur'an. And, but there was never, ever a time in the time of the Prophet Wasallam that he stopped remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you remember Allah in private and in public. Let's give an example. In private, we're talking about the dhikr. When you sit, you remember Allah, you recite the Qur'an, you say subhanallah and alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, and so on. From these adhkar in private are that which has a specific description in the sharia ah and that which has a general. Sometimes we call them adhkar mutlaqa and muqayyada. Adhkar that are unrestricted and adhkar that are restricted. So the example of the adhkar which are unrestricted, like saying subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu akbar, generally speaking, astaghfirullah, you just you go through your day saying it from time to time without a specific time, without a specific number, without a specific description. As for the adhkar which are muqayyada, which are limited, like after the salah saying subhanallah 33 times and alhamdulillah 33 times and Allahu Akbar 33 times and then finishing it with la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. You can't say it 40 times. You can't say it 41 times. You can't say it after you finish your hajj or after finish, you finish your day of fasting. And it has to be done at the time and the way that the sharia came with. As for the adhkar that are mutlaqa, that are unrestricted, those have the opposite problem. You can't restrict them. So you can't say, say this 72 times. You have to have evidence for it. So you can't bring a restriction in a dhikr which is unrestricted and you can't take a, a dhikr which has a restricted way and do it however you want. And that is in light of what he said prior to that about the people who are sticking to the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is your own personal adhkar. The adhkar which are mutlaqa and muqayyada, personal adhkar. As for al-i'lan, that which is done publicly, the gatherings of remembrance, of knowledge, the praise of Allah, we begin, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala abdillahi wa rasul. We begin with the hamd, the hamdala, the basmala. We begin our gatherings. In our gatherings, we remember Allah. We don't let a gathering go by without the remembrance of Allah. When we finish a gathering together, we have kafaratul majlis. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. We have things that we begin our gatherings and finish our gatherings with. And when we talk about the future, we say inshallah. And even in public, we have it. And again, we don't take something that the sharia told us to do in private and make it something in public. So we don't sit all together and say, Subhanallah, 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 all together, if the Sharia didn't come with that. And it doesn't matter what situation you are in. And this statement, Al-Ahyan, it has a benefit. And from the benefits of it is that every single time of day and situation you're in, there are adhkar connected to it. And from the best of resources for this that I would strongly advise everybody to have a copy of is the book Hisnul Muslim, Fortress of the Muslim by Saeed Al-Qahtani, uh, the Saeed Al-Qahtani, the author. Uh, the author, he wrote 
and he, it's, an ama it's amazing what he wrote, to be honest. A small book, it's very, very small. You've seen Fortress of the Muslims. It's just a tiny little booklet. You can get it on your phone, get it as an app, you get it as a PDF, you can get it as a booklet. I believe what lies from the first, from the early books that should be given to your kids. I and mean, most of the time we say to the kids, they're not allowed to read anything besides the Quran. And we just heft off the Quran with the young kids. But one thing I would give to the kids along with their reading of the Quran is a small book of adhkar that they learn how to say the dhikr and all the different situations you can be in and the different circumstances and that there is a dhikr for every one of them. أحسن الله إليكم يتقربون إلى المليك بفعلهم طاعاته والترك للعصيان. Give the English for it as well. They seek closeness to the king through working obedience and abandoning disobedience. Here, al-Nadim رحمه الله تعالى he brought والله he brought a lot of benefits in this very small line of poetry. It's a lot to talk about. How does the person traveling on this journey to Allah get near to Allah? How do they come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do they gain his love? We've spoken about gaining love through following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here there's another aspect. يَتَقَرَّبُونَ إِلَى الْمَلِيكِ بِفِعْلِهِمْ طَاعَاتِهِ وَالتَّرْكِ لِلْإِسْيَانِ they come near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-Malik. And al-Malik and al-Malik are from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are authentically reported about him in the Qur'an. They come near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who has everything, everything is in his possession and control. And all rulings belong to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is the, and if you look at the meaning of al-Malik and al-Malik, the meaning goes around those things. It goes around the meaning of possession and ownership, the meaning of control and command, and the meaning of legislating and the meaning of reward and punishment. Those are some of the main meanings that it goes around. Because if you look at a, a king, a sovereign, in the world, Allah, you cannot compare Allah to anything. But if you look at just the meaning of the word, the king in this world, a king is the one who has ownership, who commands for things to be done, who sets out what is allowed to do and what is not allowed to do, and who rewards the people who do what he wanted and punishes the people who don't. That's a general description of a sovereign. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى To Allah belongs the highest example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything in the heavens and the earth belongs to him. Nothing can go outside of his, in what belongs to him. No one has anything without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything anyone owns in this world is because Allah azza wa gave it to them. Allah's command cannot be rejected. لا يرد أمره. His command, no one can go against it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُن فيكون. Be, it will be. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who legislated this sharia and the laws and commanded what is allowed and what is not allowed. And that's a very appropriate name to what the Nadim mentions. He chose a name in the meaning of the one who sets down the rules of what is allowed and what's not allowed and what is a worship and what is not and what will bring you near to him and what will not. And then the one who rewards those who obey him and the one who threatens punishment for those who disobey him. This is Al-Malik, subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do they get near to Allah? They get near to Allah by what the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith Qudusi, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Man adali waliyan faqad adhantuhu bilharb. Or kama qal, 
whoever shows enmity to a wali of mine, a beloved servant of mine, I have declared war upon him. And now here comes the point that he made. Here comes the point that he made. That a person cannot become near to Allah. My servant cannot come near to me with anything, with shayin. He can't come near to me with anything more beloved than what I made obligatory for him. So if you want to come near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dhikr is the easiest, no doubt. It's the way you start off remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now you need to look at what did Allah make obligatory for you? What is fard upon you? You can't gain the love of Allah by doing optional deeds without doing the fard. That's the first thing. My servant will not stop coming near to me with voluntary deeds until I love him. And that's why he said that you come near to Allah. These people on this journey, they come near to Allah by doing what Allah commanded them to do and leaving what Allah commanded them to leave and leaving what Allah declared to be sinful. So we understood that this is actually the definition of taqwa. The definition of Talq ibn Habib. Al-amalu bi ta'atillah ala nurin min Allah. Raja'a thawabillah wa tarku ma'asillah ala nurin min Allah makhafata a'thabillah. He said, you act in obedience to Allah upon a light of guidance from Allah, hoping for Allah's reward. All this came in the poem, right? The guidance of the sunnah, hoping for Allah's reward, doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to do. Leaving what Allah declared to be sinful. With a light of guidance from Allah, because you're scared of Allah's punishment. This is taqwa. And that taqwa incidentally connects us to what? To the topic of Ramadan. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ The purpose of Ramadan is to achieve taqwa. Taqwa is to obey Allah with guidance, i.e. the guidance of the sunnah, hoping for Allah's reward, to leave disobeying Allah with guidance from Allah, i.e. the sunnah and the Qur'an, Fearing Allah's punishment. And all of that came in these few lines of poetry. This is what you get near to Allah with. And in this you have to have awlawiyyat. You have to have a sense of what is more important and what is less important. Now that doesn't mean we're telling you don't do a good deed. I'm not saying to you, you know, for example, you love to, let's say, give sadaqah. But you know, you're struggling maybe with your zakah. I'm not saying to you stop giving sadaqah. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, it's, it, this is voluntary, that's obligatory, just stop doing that until you do the other one. No, perhaps that voluntary deed you do might be something by which Allah forgives you and gives you success to do what is good. But I'm saying that in Islam, you will not get near to Allah until the zakah comes with the sadaqah. Does that make sense? If you're from the people who has to pay zakah. You can't be near to Allah giving sadaqah and holding back zakah. You can't be near to Allah praying Qiyamul Layl and missing Salatul Fajr. You can't get near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he being kind to your brothers and being bad to your parents. Does that make sense? You can't get near to Allah. I'm not saying stop being kind to the brothers. Be, be horrible to the brothers and be horrible to your parents. No, it doesn't work like that. But you can't, you cannot keep getting a step forward on this journey. You're, you're walking on a road. You cannot step forward until you first bring what is obligatory and then you also bring, and on top of that, you get nearer and nearer by what is recommended. And taqwa encompasses all of that. There's another benefit in this line, which I really appreciate that he said, and that is a tarku. عبادة كما أن الفعل عبادة 
like doing something is ibadah, abstaining from something can also be ibadah, but it has conditions. Just like doing something can be an ibadah, any attaqarrub ila Allah bi fi'li ma amr. Doing, getting near to Allah by doing what Allah commanded. So also keeping away from what Allah prohibited with the intention of getting near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I am leaving this, I'm leaving this, uh, yani which is haram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to get near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we said, even the fara'id, even the obligatory deeds, they have awlawiyat in them. Things more important than other things. And likewise, the nawafil, the voluntary deeds, have awlawiyat in them. Things which are more important than other things. So even in the things that you must do, there are things that are more important and things that are less important. And so what you have to do is look at yourself in light of the judgment of Islam about you, the judgment of Allah Azza wa Jal about you, the Sharia about you. Yani in other words, it's not what you think about yourself, but what does the Quran and Sunnah say about you in terms of your actions? And what are you missing? And here where a person subhanAllah could be doing so many good deeds, but they see when they look at themselves and they take themselves to account, they actually see that and this encompasses muhasabatun nafs taking yourself to account the person looks at themselves and says you know what it is subhanallah I might be doing some good in some things but wallahi I am falling short in this aspect in a big way and some people are giving da'wa lectures you know maybe qari of the Quran whatever it is he's doing good for the people like he might be like a candle he gives out light but if you look at himself he's just burning himself so you have to look at yourself and ask yourself where do I stand with regard to these fara'id and with regard to these nawafil and where can I improve and where is critical for me to work on more than anything else the major sins are not equal so you've got major sins you've got minor sins minor sins when they are done with impunity you don't care about them become major sins so if you do a minor sin over and over again and you don't care about it, you don't think it's important, it becomes a major sin. Not the minor sin itself, but the fact that you don't care about it. The sins are not equal. The greatest of the sins. That you make a partner with Allah while you know that Allah created you. But even making a partner with Allah Shirkun akbar wa shirkun asghar. There are severe examples that take you out of Islam and there are serious examples that don't take you out of Islam like showing off and things like that. But both of them, Allah does not forgive. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika li min It means he doesn't forgive it if you die upon it without tawbah. As for if you make tawbah, man taba taba Allahu alayhi. Whoever makes tawbah, Allah will accept his tawbah. So this tells us that it's not just about the sins it's also about falling short in what you're supposed to be doing. Sometimes people say, I didn't sin today. Say, Allah, that person didn't really think about themselves. If you thought about all the things that you are supposed to be doing with what Allah has given you. Allah has given you ras mal. Allah has given you money to invest. What is that, yani, what do you call it, uh, that, that uh, capital that Allah has given you to invest? Your lifespan your health, your youth, the rizq that Allah has given you. Allah has given it for you to invest. Now you have to decide what do you want to invest in. Wasting that is itself a sin. So all of these things you have to look at in judging and coming to and taking yourself to account with where you stand in terms of doing what Allah commanded and leaving what Allah is prohibited. And here, it brings you to uh, <clears throat> any, a benefit which we can link to what came before in Surah Al-Hujarat. 
when Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِسْيَانِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الرَّاشِدُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَةً وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, It is Allah who made you love iman. You didn't love iman by yourself. Allah helped you, caused you to love iman. And he made it beautiful in your hearts. And he made you hate disbelief and defiance and disobedience. They are the rightly guided, the people who love Iman and hate every kind of disobedience. And this is a grace from Allah and a blessing. It's not something you deserve. So whatever you do with that grace, you cannot do enough to pay back what you owe. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises to help those people who try hard. If you work hard and strive hard, Allah will guide you to His ways. Hassanallahu alaykum. Fi'l al faraid wa al nawafil da'buhum ma'a ru'yat al taqsir wa al nuqsani. The next one, inshallah. Sabar al nufus ala al makarih kulliha. شوقا إلى ما فيه من إحساني. Performing obligations and the voluntary deeds is their way, while seeing shortcoming and deficiency. They train their souls to show patience over all dislikable things, hoping to attain what that contains of benevolence. فعل الفرائض والنوافل دأبهم and here, da'buhum. And what, I like, what I understand from this da'buhum here is that this is their continuous habit. Is to do what Allah commanded them to do and to do what Allah recommended them to do. So the person who wants to move forward in the journey to Allah Azza wa Jal this person who wants to move forward with that journey is a person who is focused upon doing the fara'id and the nawafil. What would happen if a person restricted themselves to only the fara'id? If they did a good job of that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would accept it from them. and They would be from the people of Jannah because they did what Allah told them to do. But the, the nawafil have a great benefit. From the great benefits of the nawafil, the voluntary deeds, is it provides a buffer for you between yourself, where you are, and where you start to sin. So all of us fall. All of us know our iman, al-iman yazidu wa yanqus. Yazidu bil ta'a wa yanqusu bil ma'asiyah. Your iman goes up when you obey Allah. And your iman goes down when you disobey Allah. And all of us know we have times, every one of us, Wallahi, even the most righteous person on the face of this earth today has times where their iman goes down and down and down. But the question is, if you have nawafil, what do you have? You have somewhere of a buffer. You know when you start to slow down, Okay, maybe you're not praying Qiyam as much as you were. Maybe you're not praying as long as you were. But you're still praying Fajr. You're still praying Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. You're still praying your Ratiba, your Sunnah, your, your Ratibs, your regular sunnah, Sunnahs or Sunnah prayers. Then you drop a bit more. Maybe you miss some of your Sunnah prayers. But you're still praying Fajr on time and Dhuhr on time. So there is a, a buffer in which you have some room to fall without falling into what is sinful or what takes you out of Islam. The second benefit is the benefit of it making up for the flaws in your fara'id. We know this, the famous hadith about the salah. The first thing you'll be taking to account from your actions, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, is the salah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if your salah is deficient, he will say to the angel, look and see if my servant has any voluntary prayers. What we're going to do? That will make up for the deficiency in the obligatory prayers. That doesn't mean you didn't pray Fajr, it would be made up.
But let's say, for example, you had some times where your mind is not there, you're not concentrating, you maybe you know, did something you, you shouldn't have, you made some slips, which your prayer is still accepted, but you need to make up for it. So your voluntary deeds make up for those. Your voluntary deeds are a means to get nearer to Allah. The fard will get you close, but you can't get really close until you bring the voluntary deeds. And the voluntary deeds help you to do the fard. You know, subhanAllah, people, when you're not, you know, before Islam, you sit there thinking, subhanAllah, how can anybody pray five times a day? And the person who prays five times a day, but doesn't pray their ratiba, for example, they say, I don't know how anyone can pray all those sunnah prayers without missing them. And the person who prays those sunnah prayers, but doesn't pray, let's say, qiyamul layl, I don't know how anyone can get up in the morning before Fajr and pray. And you see how it drives you to something more, and it makes what is behind you easier. It makes it easier for you. And it's from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are many, many benefits. So don't look down upon these nawafil. The nawafil could be the reason for you to be forgiven. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا ولو أن تلقى أخاك بوجه طلق Don't belittle any good deed. Even if it is greeting your brother with a smiling face. It's greeting your brother with a smiling face. Fard or nafil? Nafila, right? It's, it's, recommended, it's a recommended act. It's not, you're not sinful if you don't smile at your brother. But that could be the reason that Hafid bin Hajar commented on this hadith. He said, that could be the reason a person goes to Jannah. You could go to Jannah, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, because you smiled at your brother. Wallahi, you could come and the scales are even. And like Ibn Hazm said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Wallahi, I do not know how can I come Yawm Al-Qiyamah and have done enough good deeds that my scales are even. Allahu Akbar. I don't know how I can do even to make my scales even with all the sins that I have. But you don't know your scales are even and you're looking for something, you smiled at your brother. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you into Jannah for it. Likewise, إِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْقِرَاتِ الظُّنُوبِ Keep away from the sins people think are insignificant. You don't know the little sin that might tip the balance. Can the makru tip the balance and put you into Jahannam? No. Because the makru is something you cannot be punished for doing it. That which is makru in terms of, in today's terminology. As a benefit, when the early generation said makru, they mean haram. Al makru. Generally speaking, it means haram. But in عند المتأخرين or في اصطلاح المتأخرين, the word makruh generally means uh, that which you are rewarded for leaving but not punished for, for doing. So it's your dab, it's your habit, it's your manners, it's, your, it's the way that you are upon it all the time. You're working hard for it. But what do you see yourself as when you're doing all those fara'id and all of those nawafil? In terms of tazkiyatun nafs and tarbiyatun nafs, muhasabatun nafs, how do you see yourself? You see that I am muqassir, I'm falling short. I'm not doing enough. My deeds are not good enough. And that's part of your fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's part of your humility and it's part of recognizing what Allah deserves and what you're bringing to the table. What are you bringing? You're bringing deficient goods. You're bringing a prayer that you are only paying attention for one tenth of it. And the rest of the time you are thinking about what you're going to eat after the salah. You're bringing a prayer where you concentrated the whole time and wallahi, how long did you pray for? Four minutes, three minutes. Does Allah deserve that or does Allah deserve more than that? Wallahi, Allah deserves more than that. Allah deserves better than that. Allah doesn't need it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need our ibadah. But Allah deserves better than what we bring. We bring deficient goods to the table. We bring ibadat that are 
full of at-taqsir wa nuqsan Deficiencies and flaws And not done properly and half-heartedly And even if we do them properly They're not what Allah deserves Look at the angels لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويعملون ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. They do not disobey Allah in what He commands them to do, and they do what they are commanded. They do what they're commanded. Where are you from that? Where is your ibadah in comparison to that? Their whole twenty-four hours in ibadah. Without mistakes. Like in our ibadah is full of flaws, full of deficiency, full of times where we just didn't do, we didn't even do what Allah told us to do, let alone what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves from us. So we see that deficiency. We see all the things we're supposed to do that we didn't do. All the actions, all the things, the blessings Allah gave us that we didn't show gratitude for. And that benefits you because that drives you to push yourself. The worst thing that can happen or among the worst things that can happen to you is for you to become impressed with your own worship. It's like being impressed with your own knowledge. As soon as someone becomes impressed with their own actions, guarantee that that person is going to fall and fall very far. When they've become impressed by their own actions, who became impressed by their own actions? Iblis, al the accursed. He became impressed with his worship of Allah. He looked down upon Adam. Ana khayrun min, I'm better than him. You're going to put me to tell me to bow to this person when I'm better than him. He became impressed with himself and he became proud and he became arrogant. And wallahi, it's a very, very big fall. And it's the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal. When people become impressed by their own actions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them down. And the person who humbles themselves and sees themselves to be falling short, what do they do? They have two great benefits or more, at least two great benefits. Number one, they bring the ibadah of humility. The ibadah, they actually worship Allah through humility. They see themselves as a slave and Allah is their Lord. That's the first thing. They don't get arrogant. From the benefits of it is the person is always trying to, to improve. They're not stopping there. They're keeping trying to be better and better and better. So this issue of uh, and humility and seeing yourself as falling short, it fulfills your status as a servant and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your Lord and Master. And it stops you being impressed with what you've done. It allows you to lower yourself before Allah. And Allah raises you because of it. And that's the rule, right? The more you lower yourself, the more Allah will raise you. And the more you raise yourself, the more Allah will lower you and put you down. So lower yourself. Be humble before the people. Be humble before Allah, first of all. Approach Allah with a humble heart. Realize that you're going to fall short. And then the third benefit that I was going to mention is that it makes you beg Allah for his help and guidance. You realize that, you know what this, Ya Rabb, I cannot worship you unless you help me. I cannot even do 1% of the worship that you require from me, that you ask me to do, I cannot do 1% of that worship unless you help me. Not even half of that, not even a tenth of that. I can't bring an atom's weight of good unless you help me. And so you become dependent upon Allah. You approach Allah as the one who is, has inkisar. Bayna yadai Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're broken. Like a conscript in the army, the first thing they do is they break you, right? They break your spirit so you don't you listen to everything that you get told to do. The first thing they do in the army is they break your rebellious spirit. They stop you being like having your own opinion about anything. They tell you when to get up, they tell you when to go to sleep, they tell you when to dress, when not to, they tell you when to run, when to stop, 
when to stand, when to sit. They break your independent spirit. That is beloved when you do it to Allah, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you approach Allah as a one who is broken, Ya Rabb, I have no decision. I have no ability. I have no choice. I have no opinion. All I have is servitude to you. And that, subhanAllah, is, comes from seeing your deeds to be deficient and lacking. They say that the scholars see their deeds, you know, the scholars see their sins as a mountain about to crush them. And the ignorant person sees their sins as a fly, they swat them away. I sin, but never mind. Allah Kareem. But the alim sees his sins like a mountain that's about to crush him. As long as it doesn't lead to despair, because we have al khawf al raja. صَبَرُ النُّفُوسَ عَلَى الْمَكَارِهِ كُلِّهَا شَوْقًا إِلَى مَا فِيهِ مِنْ إِحْسَانِ Now he comes on to talk about الصَّبْر Patience And الصَّبْر in, in its origin السِّعْدِ رَحِمَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى He said هُوَ حَبْسُ النَّفْسِ عَلَى مَا يَكْرَهُهُ الْإِنسَانِ إِذَا كَانَ فِيهِ رِضَى الرَّحْمَانِ It is for a person to prevent themselves, to hold themselves back. Even though they might find it hard. If they know that it brings the pleasure of the most merciful. And this sabr is of three types. Sabrun ala ta'atillah. Patience in obeying Allah. So we said obedience and keeping away from sin. Again, all the light, it all links up. So patience in obeying Allah. Your obedience to Allah, it is done with patience. It takes patience to pray five times a day. It takes patience to get up for Fajr and come to the masjid. And your nafs is telling you what? Inna nafs la ammaratun bisu. The soul is constantly inclined towards evil. Your nafs is saying this bed is very nice and comfortable. It's warm. It's cold outside. Anyways, the masjid's a bit far. It's too early. The time has changed. Your nafs is telling you and you actually push yourself to go and to pray in the jama'ah because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with the people who pray fajr in the jama'ah from among the men. The one who prays fajr in the jama'ah He's in the care of Allah, the protection of Allah, the guarantee of protection from Allah until the evening comes. SubhanAllah. But it takes sabr to do that, right? The second type is sabrun an ma'asillah keeping away from disobedience to Allah because keeping away from the haram requires sabr your nafs is telling you this is nice don't worry you make tawbah later you'll enjoy just it's okay one time one time shaitan is whispering as well shaitan is a good salesman he doesn't have power over you وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ وَمَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانِ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعُوتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي al Shaitan will say when everything is said and done, Allah promised you and his promise was true and I promised you and I broke my promise and I never had authority over you. I never had power over you. I couldn't drag you to do the haram. But I called you and you answered me. So a sabr and ma'asiyatillah is not answering your nafs and the shaitan when they call you. As for the first one, patience in obedience to Allah, from this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فَعْبُدْهُ وَاصْطَبِرْ لِعِبَادَتِهِ هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ سَمِيَّةِ in Surah Maryam. Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them, so worship him and be patient in worshipping him. Do you know of anyone who is similar to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala? There's nothing similar to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what did you understand? Worship and be consistent and regular in worshipping him. As for patience in leaving sin, then you can find it in the statement of Allah, Azza wa Jal, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى Whoever 
fears the maqam. The maqam here, the ulama, they have views about it in tafsir. Minhum man qal al maqam huwa al qiyam. Bayna yadi illahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said, maqam means standing in front of Allah. They're scared about yawm al qiyamah. So they stop their soul from what it wants to do. And from them, who are those who said the maqam here is the position, the status of Allah in his names and attributes and actions. They're scared of what is entailed by Allah's names and attributes and actions. And so they stop their soul from what it craves. Jannah is their destination. The third type of sabr, it is sabrun ala aqdari al mu'lima. Being patient upon the painful things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for a person. Now here, I prefer this word mu'lima to the word evil. Because the word evil is not good manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah doesn't create evil for evil's sake. It's not a matter of evil, but Allah decrees things for you that are painful. They are a test for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَنَبَلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ فِتْنَةِ وَإِلَيْنَا تُرْجَعُونَ Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah Azza wa Jal said, Every soul will taste death. And you, we will test you with something of evil and good as a trial. And to us you'll be returned. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees things that are painful for you as a test. To hold yourself back from what would bring the anger of Allah Azza wa Jal. To only say what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From this is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِ قَلْبَهِ Whoever believes in Allah, hear the belief in Allah, refers to the qadr of Allah Azza wa Whoever believes in Allah's qadr, yahdi qalba, Allah makes his heart settled. He doesn't say that which makes Allah angry. He doesn't say why me. He doesn't say how unfair is this world. He doesn't say these words. He only says what pleases Allah. And that's why as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in asabahu shay, if something happens to him, what does he say? He doesn't say this person who something bad happens to him. He doesn't say that Lo anni fa'altu kana kada wa kada. If only this happened to me, I would have been different. It would have been different. If only I didn't do this. What does he say? Qadarullahu wa ma sha'a fa'al or Qadarullahi wa ma sha'a fa'al. Both the hadith came both ways. Fa'inna law taftahu amal shaitan. Because the word law, if only, opens the door of the shaitan. So he remains patient. He doesn't say, he doesn't say, if only this happened, if only I didn't do this. He remains patient and Allah settles his heart because of his patience in doing what? In holding himself back from saying something that would, that would anger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or saying something that would entail going against the decree of Allah and his wisdom. So what is the requirement in the first type of sabr? Continuity and regularity in doing good deeds. The most beloved deeds to Allah are the most regular, even if they are small. What's required in the second one? Disobeying your nafs and the shaitan. It's a line of poetry. If I'm not mistaken, one of the Sahaba is, is ma'thur from, from some of the Sahaba or from some of the Salaf anyway, the Sahaba or the Tabi'een. He said, رَأَيْتُ الذُّنُوبَ تُمِيتُ الْقُلُوبَ وَيُتْبِعُ هَذُّلَ إِدْمَانُهَا وَتَرْكُ الذُّنُوبِ حَيَاتُ الْقُلُوبِ وَخَيْرٌ لِنَفْسِكَ عِسْيَانُهَا He said, I saw that sins kill the heart and disgrace follows the regular, and you know, like being addicted to them and having that regular practice of them, what comes from that is disgrace. And leaving sin is the life of the heart and it's better for you to disobey your own soul. It's better for you that you disobey your own soul. That's what's required for you in the second type of sabr. 
is disobeying your own soul. In the third is only to say what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to hold yourself back from saying anything that would be disrespectful to Allah or ungrateful to Allah Azza wa Jal in the face of the problems you're, you're going through at the moment. And eventually there are levels beyond that like being, ple being pleased with what Allah decrees for you no matter what it is and so on. أحسن الله إليكم نزلوا بمنزلة الرضا فهموا بها قد أصبحوا في جنة وأماني نعم uh, here I have you have جنة right I also have I also have جنة here uh, let me see where's my I also have Jannah here. In some of the of the scripts, they have the word Jannah, but I think here in both of the reliable copies I have, I have Jannah. Like in, in one of them, I do have fi Jannatin, but I think that the the correct one here I can say is Jannah. Now, we can read the translation. They entered the station of Allah's pleasure, and by way of that, they became shielded and secured. Now he talks about the highest A'la yani the, What is higher than sabr Is there something higher? Because this is manazil, right? You're going through levels and stages Is there a place higher than sabr? There is Ar-rida The station of pleasure Being pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for you why are they pleased? Because they know that their Lord is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Al-Kareem Ar-Ra'uf Allah is the most merciful, the bestower of mercy, the most generous, the most kind And they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only decree for you The best set of opportunities For your personal situation I'm not saying everything Allah decrees for you is pleasurable for you That's not the case But everything Allah decrees for you Is, a, is the best Tailor made opportunity For you to succeed And that is يعني من مقتضيات اسم الله تبارك وتعالى الرحمن الرحيم الرؤوف الكريم الأكرم You cannot say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Decrees for you that which will make things problematic and difficult and close the doors for you. Wallahi, when Allah is decreeing things for you, He's opening a door for you in that particular situation that is tailor made to be the best opportunity for you to get near to Him. But you have to take it. Have you ever thought why it is that Allah Azza wa Jal decrees for some people wealth and some people poverty? Why it is that Allah decrees for some people health and some people yeah, any sickness? Why is it that Allah decrees for some people life and some people yeah, any death? I mean, everything at its specific time. Some people lose their loved ones, some people don't, some people have children, some people don't. Is this all random? Is it just random gifts given out to whoever he wants? He has the right to do that. Allah has the right to give out those gifts randomly. The right, I say. And in حقه subhanahu wa ta'ala It belongs to him If someone gives you a gift that belongs to them You can't say why do you not give him as well And it's a gift But Allah Out of his wisdom and his mercy and generosity He does not give his gifts at random He gives his gifts to his servants Based on his hikmah And that's why Allah said Fadlan min Allahi wa ni'ma Wallahu alimun hakim Allah knows exactly which grace to give to which servant, exactly which blessing to give to which servant, and exactly which one is wise for them. So if Allah decreed for you poverty, not only should you not be angry with Allah, rather you should actually see it as an opportunity that Allah has decreed this because He knows this is what is best for me right now. 
So what is required from me? I'm not saying to wallow in poverty. I'm not saying to sit around crying or just to sit around saying that's what Allah. But to say that now Allah has, when you have poverty, Allah has given you certain things that you come near to him with in a state of poverty. That you don't come near to him with in a state of wealth. Certain things you come near to Allah with in a state of sickness that you don't come near to him with in a state of health. Each one has its own ibadat, right? So when you're healthy, you come near to Allah Azza wa Jal through certain things. You know, worship and lengthening your worship and you know, doing extra voluntary acts on top. But also when you're sick, you come near to Allah with other things. Your patience, your continuation of remembering Allah and doing the best you can in the condition that you're in. Your dua to Allah, asking Him for a cure. Your istishfa by the Qur'an, asking him, trying to get a cure from the Qur'an. Look how each one of them has its ibadat. So now you say, if Allah has put me in this situation, what are the ibadat in this situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me? Because it's tailor-made for me. This is chosen for me because of a specific thing within me that Allah knows it's best for me like this. So I become pleased with what my Lord has chosen for me. Because it's like, instead of having your own choice, instead of you going and choosing from the, the menu, you let someone choose who knows you better. You know, subhanAllah, it's like you go to a restaurant and you see the menu. You see, you know what it is? You know what I like. You know the restaurant better. You know the food better. You know who I am. You know what I like. You choose for me. And you're happy for your friend to choose. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى To Allah belongs the highest example. Nothing is comparable to Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he chose for you in this life is the most perfect, suited, best opportunity that is going to work for you. So take it, embrace it, be happy with it. Isn't sickness a time where you can get near to Allah? Wallahi, there's some people, they got sick. Wallahi, they're in a ni'mah they cannot imagine. For example, let me give an example. Remember the people who get, sometimes they get a diagnosis that they've been afflicted with a terminal illness. The doctor says, I'm sorry, but you have a sickness that we're not expecting you're going to recover from, and I don't think you have very long left in this life. That person might think, I'm in a terrible situation. Wallahi, I say, wallahi, thumma tallahi, that person is in a ni'mah, that people should be jealous of the ni'mah they have. Because how many people die, mawt, mufaja'ah, sudden death, they don't think about Allah. They don't prepare for their death. They don't even, death doesn't even cross their mind. And Allah takes them baghtatan like that. And they're disobeying him. For someone to say, Akhi, get your affairs in order. You know your time, you don't have a lot of time. Wallahu alam, so make yourself right. Make your tawbah, do what you can. That person is in a ni'mah, wallahi. They have a chance to now prepare for what some people get suddenly they don't prepare for. But that ni'mah is tailor-made for that person. It's not for everybody, right? For some people and other people, they're just working and hard and striving and doing everything they can. And Allah takes them in a good situation. Allah takes them in their sajda, in their prayer, in their qiyam, in their doing their good deeds on their hajj and their umrah. For subhanAllah, how Allah chooses for everybody what is good for them. So embrace what Allah chose for you. Does that mean that you don't do any actions to change? Does that mean the sick person says, okay, Stop the medicine, guys. This is what Allah has decreed for me. No. Fi'lul asbab is a different matter. Allah requires you to do the actions that bring about the result that you want. You want to get better? So you take your medicine, you do your ruqya, you, you, know, you seek the cure from the Quran, you make dua, you drink zamzam, you take prophetic medicine. You're doing what you can. But you're pleased with whatever Allah decrees for you. It's like dua. You make dua to Allah. Udu'u Allah. Make dua when you are certain Allah is going to answer you. But if Allah doesn't answer you, how do you feel? Depressed, suicidal? No, you feel content. That this dua, maybe Allah saved it for me for Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Maybe this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Alhamdulillah. Maybe this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, took an evil away from me because of it. Maybe this dua Allah has chosen to give it to me later on when it's going to be better for me. 
Alhamdulillah. You feel pleased with what Allah has chosen and you keep making dua, you don't stop. When you're in a state of contentment with what Allah decrees, you're shielded from anything bad happening to you. Ajaban li amri mu'min. How amazing is the affair of the believer? Because every single thing, every single thing, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for you, you understand that it has a purpose and a wisdom behind it. So you're shielded. However, interesting, I said about Jannah and Jannah. A Si'di, now to complicate things, when he explains this, he explains it as Jannah. He calls it Jannah to Dunya. Like, and also, he himself said Jannah. So it came like that and like that. Yani Jannah, in the sense of, yani the person is in the Jannah of this Dunya. That Rida, he said, a Rida is called Jannah to Dunya. That the paradise of this world is to be pleased with what Allah has decreed has decreed for you. What is the reality of, of being pleased with Allah? It's not just being pleased with Qadr. It's also being pleased with His Ahkam Shari'a. Being pleased with Allah's decree and being pleased with what Allah Allah's laws. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَرِهُ that's because they hated what Allah sent down. Allah destroyed their deeds. Allah destroyed their deeds. Allah destroyed their deeds because of the fact that they hated, they disliked what Allah sent down. So being pleased with Allah's deen. Today I have completed your religion for you and I have completed my favor upon you. And Allah Azza wa Jalla is pleased for Islam to be our deen. So we should be pleased with it. That's why Sa'di Rahimullah Ta'ala he said, Hakikatul Rida Talaqi Ahkamillahi. الأمرية الدينية وأحكامه الكونية القدرية بانشراح صدر وسرور نفس لا على وجه التكره والتلم والتلم. He said that the reality of it is that you meet Allah's legislation in terms of His deen and in terms of His قدر with an open heart. With happiness and contentment, not like someone who's been forced to do something or someone who is finds it to be distasteful. And that's the reality of Arrida. Ahsanallahu ilaykum. Shakaru ladi awla al khalaiqa fadlahu bil kalbi wal akwali wal arkani. They were grateful to the one who favored the creatures with his bounty, with the heart, statements, and performance of the pillars. I think performance of the pillars here is a, is a mistranslation. I think arkan here means your limbs. Wallahu alam. That arkan here, bil qalbi wal aqwali wal arkani, yani al arkan here means al jawari. They were grateful. To the one. They were grateful. What does it say in the translation? They were grateful to? The one who favored the, cre the creatures. With his bounty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who with his ala, his blessings and his bounties, he favored us. We mentioned that. Fadlan min Allahi wa ni'mah. It's a grace from Allah and a blessing. Shukr, the reality of it, he tells you here. The reality of shukr. And shukr is a response to what? A ni'mah. That's the difference between hamd and shukr, right? One of the differences between hamd and shukr is that hamd is mutlaq in every situation. Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. Praise to Allah in every situation. As for shukr, shukr is in response to a ni'mah. 
This shukr as well, hamd, is something which is professed on the tongue. Based on what you have in your heart. As for shukr, shukr is something that encompasses the heart and the tongue and the limbs. What's the evidence? The statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, I'malu ala Dawood shukra. Act or family of Dawood in gratitude. So Allah commanded them to be grateful through actions. So gratefulness starts with al i'tiraf, confession, and admitting that the blessing came from Allah. And loving Allah for that blessing in the heart. And then professing gratitude for that blessing on the tongue. And then using what you've been given of blessings to come near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Getting near to Allah with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And this can be evidenced in the statement of Allah azza wa jal. With regard to Qarun and Bani Israel that they said to Qarun. وَبَتَغِي فِيمَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهِ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ وَلَا تَبَغِي الْفَسَادَ فِي الْأَرْضِ This ayah وَبَتَغِي فِيمَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ Use what Allah has given you for the دار الآخرة Everything Allah has given you Allah has given you health, Allah has given you money, Allah has given you intelligence, Allah has given you uh, sabr in, in certain hardships, Allah is whatever Allah has given you, use it to get the dar al-akhirah. Don't forget, you're allowed to have a portion of this dunya. Nobody said that you have to, it's haram for you to have something from this dunya. And be good to others like Allah has been good to you. وَلَا تَبَغِي الْفَسَادَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And don't corrupt on the earth. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُفْسِدِينَ Allah does not love the people who corrupt on the earth. So show your gratitude to Allah in the actions that you do with your heart. Confessing to the blessing, loving Allah because of it, speaking of it. وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Even though the tafsir of the ayah here is to spread the message of Islam, Wallahu alam. And that's the that's Asharul Tafsir, the most famous tafsir of the ayah. Wa amma bi ni'mati rabbika fahadith is to tell the people of the ni'mah of Islam. Like in any case, to, to, to speak of the blessings Allah has given you, to praise Allah for them, and to use them to get near to Allah. If Allah has given you wealth, use it, use it for Allah, use it to buy the akhirah. Have you ever thought, my brothers? That Allah Azza wa Jal describes our relationship with Him so many times in the Quran as tijara, business. فَمَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ وَمَا كَانُوا مُهْتَدِينَ Their business didn't make a profit. And they were not guided. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَى تِجَارَةٍ تُنْجِيكُمْ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Or you who believe, shall I tell you about a business? Shall I show you a business that will save you from a severe punishment? A painful punishment. It's a business. What's it a business? Allah has given you capital. Allah has given you a life. Allah has given you money. Allah has given you health. Allah has given you tools. You choose what you buy. This is your ras mal, your capital. Now you choose what you're going to go and buy. What are you going to go and buy with what Allah has given you? Allah gave you life. Allah gave you health. Allah gave you some money. Allah gave you some intelligence. Allah gave you some circumstances and abilities now what are you going to go buy? You can go and use it for dalal, misguidance. You can go and use it for destruction. You can go and use it to make facade on the earth. Or you can use it to buy the akhirah. In reality, you don't buy the akhirah directly. What you do is you work and because of your efforts, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you his mercy and then through his mercy you enter into paradise bi idnihi subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look how Allah describes his tijara, his business. You choose what you buy with it. So choose to buy that which will bring you near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is part of shukr and ni'mah. Ahsanallahu ilaykum. صاحب التوكل في جميع امورهم مع بدل جهد في رضا الرحمن. 
They maintained reliance in all their affairs alongside tri- striving to earn the pleasure of Ar Rahman. Here, Al Nadim Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he brings a great benefit, and that is the benefit of At Tawakkul. And what is the reality of At Tawakkul? The Shaykh himself, he said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, فَحَقِيقَةُ التَّوَكُّرِ تَجْمَعُ أَمْرَيْن The reality of tawakkul brings together two matters. الْإِعْتِمَادُ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَالثِّقَةُ بِاللَّهِ It brings, يعني, it, it, it requires two matters. It requires reliance upon Allah and trust in Allah. Relying upon Allah. Have you ever heard people say, you know, you should be self, uh, what do you call it, self-reliant or you should be, you know, you should be independent. Islam doesn't really have that in an Islamic sense. It might have it in, in the sense of people, but it doesn't have it in Islamic sense. We say, don't leave me to myself for the blink of an eye. You don't want to be by yourself for even the blink of an eye. You're desperately reliant upon Allah for every single breath that you take and every beating of your heart. You, re- you are desperately in need of Allah in it. And it means also you trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you rely on Allah to bring what benefits you in your deen and your dunya. You, what do you do? He said, فَيَبْرَأُ مِن نَفْسِهِ وَحَوْرِهَا وَقُوَّتِهَا You declare yourself to be completely free of any ability to change anything or do anything without the help of Allah. لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ and you trust that Allah will bring for you what will benefit you and keep away from what will harm you. But now you have to bring now the other side. And that is you have to work hard in seeking what you want. Why do you have to work hard? Is Allah not ala kulli shayin qadir? He is. Allah can do everything. That's not hard for Allah. So why do we have to work hard? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His wisdom has decreed that He asks us and requests from us, commands us that we do the things that Allah has placed as causes to achieve our goals. Al-asbab. So Allah has placed certain things as causes. For example, if Allah Azza wa Jal willed to give you a child from the sky to just come down from the sky wallahi it's not difficult for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but is that the sunnah of allah is the sunnah of allah that when you ask allah rabbi la tadharni fardan wa anta khayrul warithin that is the children start coming down from the sky no it's not the sunnah of allah is that allah is the gives you the success to get married and you start a family this is the way of Allah. This is what Allah has decreed that the way that this world works. So you try your best with what Allah has given you. You're not doing something that Allah has not given you. You're doing what Allah has placed on this earth. You're sick, Allah has placed medicines and ruqya and you know Allah has placed things on this earth for you to try your efforts, but you realize that these efforts have nothing in them except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. So you are required to do the causes that bring about the result that you want, the things that will bring about that result, to strive for them and work for them, while realizing that the one who will bring that result about is not that cause. And getting married in itself is not the cause of having children. Rather, Allah is the one who gives who He wants daughters and gives who He wants sons and who He wants, He gives them daughters and sons together. How many people get married? They can't have kids. 
So you do the sabab, the cause, while realizing that the musabib, the one who brings that cause about, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wahtahu la sharika, alone and with no partner. So the reality of tawakkul is not tawakkul. It's not that you lie down and say, if Allah wanted to give me a child, it would have come down from the heavens. It's amazed me, one of the, tabi the, the, the females of the tabi'een, the females of the tabi'een, one of the female scholars of the tabi'een, she has a statement, Wallahi, it amazed me, Wallahi. That when you make dua to Allah to enrich you, to give you wealth, Allah does not cause gold and silver to rain down from the sky. But Allah will give you an opportunity to earn it through something in this world. Something will come to you from it. And therefore, when that thing comes to you, don't reject it. And subhanAllah, you're saying, Ya Rabb, enrich me, oh my Lord, pay my debt, oh my Lord, help me. And then someone comes and says, you know what, there's a good, it's a good job, opportunity. Say, no, no, I'm just, I'm making, I'm waiting for the rain, the, the gold and silver coins to come. No, you do what Allah has placed on this earth for you. It's not the sunnah of Allah that gold and silver coins rain down from the sky, if, even though it's not hard for Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala easily, with no difficulty, can make the gold and silver coins rain down from the sky. But it is not the way, the wisdom that Allah has chosen. It's not what is meant by his name, Al-Latif, the one who is subtle. The blessings come from unusual sources. You didn't imagine it would come from that, it came. And so like that, those blessings come. And like that, you strive for the means Allah has placed on this earth. And that is what the reality of tawakkul I mean, the reality of tawakkul is it's not doing the asbab and ignoring Allah and it's not that you ask Allah and ignore what Allah has placed on this earth as a cause for what you're seeking to achieve but you join between the two in a middle path. Ahsanallahu <laughs> ilaykum Abadul ilaha ala atiqadi hudurihi فَتَبَوَّأُوا فِي مَنْزِلِ الْإِحْسَانِ They worshipped the one true deity Allah was believing in his presence, so they exonerated themselves by attaining the station of Al-Ihsan. So now, Al-Nazim, Rahimahullahu Ta'ala, he speaks about Al-Ihsan. And he speaks about Al-Ihsan in with its two pillars. Because we know from the hadith of Jibreel, Ihsan has two pillars. أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَى فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ The highest level of Ihsan is for you to worship Allah as though you can see Him. You worship Allah as though Allah Azza wa Jal is in front of you. And if you cannot do that, if you cannot reach a level where you worship Allah as though you are bef yani, as though you can see him then at least know that Allah azza wa jal can see you worship Allah knowing that Allah can see you and these are the pillars of ihsan they worship al ilah here there's a latifa benefit he gave you the definition of al ilah in the poem he gave you the definition of Al-Ilah. And this definition comes from the Quran. It's worth writing down, Surah Zukhruf, Ayah number 45. It's well worth writing down, Surah Zukhruf, Ayah 45. That is the definition of the word Ilah by the text of the Quran. وَاسْأَلْ مَنْ أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَابَلِكَ مِنْ رُسُولِنَا أَجَعَلْنَا مِن دُونِ الرَّحْمَانِ آلِهَةً يُعْبَدُونَ Ask those that we sent before from the, yani ask those that we sent before from the messengers, have we made besides the most merciful an ilah which is worshipped? So Allah himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, defines al-ilah as al-ma'bud. The one that is worshipped. And al-ilah is not al-khaliq. That's not the meaning of al-khaliq. And I'll give you a very simple way to understand that. 
let's just say that, uh, for example, a person from, let's say, Hinduism, believes in many aliha, many gods, do they, necessar do they necessarily believe that every one of those gods is a khaliq? No chance. Six million khaliqeen? <laughs> no way. They don't believe in these million... That anyone they say that... I, you know, so they even worship their guest. When you come into the hotel, they say, you're God. وَالْعِيَاذُ billah. If you go to some of the hotels in India, they greet you and they say, you are God. How, what, you, what did I create? And you believe I created the heavens and the earth? They say, no, but you bring me benefits. And if they don't, subhanallah, they, people do not believe, even Christianity. If you ask them, do you believe Jesus, Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam, created the heavens and the earth and everything that's in it? They'll say, kalla, no way. So ilah and ilah is al-ma'bud, the one that worship is given to that, that person. That's what the reality of the ilah is. Gods that are worshipped. Abadul ilah, they worship the one who deserves worship. Believing that he is present. What is Allah Azza wa Jal present with? He says in the Quran, anytime, and so anybody, look anytime Allah speaks about being present, al ma'iyyah, the ma'iyyah of Allah, Allah being present, anytime you will see that the meaning revolves around knowledge, hearing, and sight. Any ayah, take any single ayah which speaks about the ma'iyya of Allah, Allah being with you. All of it speaks about Allah's, Allah's knowledge, Allah's hearing and Allah's sight. For example, the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal Allah says in the He's the one who created the heavens and the earth in six days. Then he rose above the throne. He knows what goes into the earth and what comes out of it and what goes down from the heavens and what comes up in it and he's with you wherever you are and Allah is seeing of everything that you do it started with ilm and it finished with sight and in the middle the ma'iyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single ayah that speaks about the ma'iyah of Allah is like that every ayah that speaks about Allah being with you all of them speak about it in light of Al-ilm and al-sam and al-basar. Allah knowing and seeing and, and hearing what you do. So that is the tafsir of the Quran. You're not allowed to make a different tafsir of it. They believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears and sees everything they do and knows everything that they do. And so, because of this knowledge, if you can't worship Allah as though you are before him, at least now, if you cannot do that, then worship Allah knowing that Allah sees you and hears you and knows everything that you do. So these people reach the level of Ihsan. Ihsan, and I know we're getting short on time, but we have another session, so we have to take a bit from the Q&A. Uh, Ihsan, Barakallahu Fikum. Still looking at it, it's okay. <laughs> Allah Musta'an. Ihsan is used in the religion in different ways. It's used meaning the highest level of voluntary worship. In this sense, Islam are the deeds that keep you as a Muslim. And Iman is doing what Allah told you and keeping away from what Allah prohibited you. 
and ihsan is the voluntary deeds. That's one way of it. In one way, it's used as the highest level of iman in the sense of knowing or being constantly aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is watching you. In one sense, it's used for exceeding expectations. And for example, you're set with a certain expectation. وَاعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Worship Allah and don't make any partner with Him and have ihsan to your parents. Go beyond what they would expect from you and exceed their expectations. That's part of the meaning of it as well. So it comes with these different meanings and that yani, is the highest level in the deen, the level of ihsan. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ وَحْدَهُ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ He said, فَإِذَا تَصَوَّرَ الْإِنسَانُ هَذَا الْمَقَامُ فِي جَمِيعِ أَحْوَالِهِ لَسِيَّمَا حَالَ الْعِبَادَةِ مَنَعَهُ مِنَ الْإِلْتِفَاتِ بِقَلْبِهِ إِلَى غَيْرِ رَبِّهِ If a person can keep this in their mind, in everything they do, especially ibadah, their heart will not turn to other than Allah. And that's why, subhanAllah, it prevents your heart from anything that would take it away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. بَلْ أَقْبَلَ بِكُلِّيَّتِهِ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَتَوَجَّهَ بِقَلْبِهِ إِلَيْهِ Rather, the person completely turns to Allah and their heart is, and their heart is completely dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, وَهَذِهِ الْمَنْزِلَةِ مِنْ أَعْظَمِ الْمَنَازِلِ وَأَجَلِّهَا وَلَكِنَّهَا تَحْتَاجُ إِلَى تَدْرِيجٍ لِلنُّفُوسِ شَيْئًا فَشَيْئًا This is from the highest of stations a person can reach. But it requires you to go step by step. You cannot just jump into a level of worship like that without taking yourself in steps. He said, وَلَا يَزَالُ الْعَبْدِ a servant continues to keep on looking at himself and keep on working with his nafs until his nafs starts to obey him. And so he becomes in a state of wonder and a state of bliss, worshipping his Lord. And that is not something which is achieved in a moment, but it's something that is achieved step by step and stage by stage. Sanallahu ilaykum. Nasahu al khaliqata fi rida mahbubihim bil ilmi wal irshadi wal ihsani. Sahibu al khalaiqa bil jusumi wa inama arwahuhum fi manzilin fawqani. They gave sincere advice to the creation about striving to please the beloved. Through knowledge, guidance, and benevolence, they accompanied the creation with their bodies whilst their souls were yearning for the higher station. Now, Allama Sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala, he speaks about an nasiha. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Surah Al Asr, everyone knows, Wal Asr, inna al insana lafi khusr. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ We know the Prophet ﷺ said, الدِّينُ nasiha This religion is nasiha. قَالُوا لِمَنْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ They said, to whom, O Messenger of Allah, قَالَ لِلَّهِ وَلِكِتَابِهِ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِأَئِمَّةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَعَامَّتِهِمْ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم to Allah, to his book, to his messenger, to the leaders of the Muslims and the general people. So what is an nasiha? An nasiha is to behave sincerely towards that person. To behave with the utmost sincerity. Some people say the religion is good advice, but it's not just advice. Advice is a part of nasiha, but nasiha doesn't just mean advice. Nasiha means to behave in a way in, with utmost sincerity, wanting good 
for that which you are behaving sincerely towards in a way that is appropriate to that particular, that particular thing. So this person has nasiha with everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala required them to have nasiha towards. They are sincere towards Allah and we've spoken about that. They are, nas- they are sincere towards the Quran and we've spoken about that in the topic of dhikr. They are, nasih- they are sincere towards the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we've spoken to that in light of following the Sunnah. And they're sincere towards the leaders of the Muslims and the general people. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. That means they want good for them. And that's why from the signs of the people of the Sunnah is to make dua for the people in authority, not against them. That doesn't mean that they are necessarily good people or necessarily doing good things. But you want good for them. You want them to be corrected so that the people within their their authority can be corrected. And you see there's no benefit in cursing them because it's not going to rectify the people in the way that you want. It's not going to bring good for them or good for the people with them. But the way you give advice to each person is not the same. Rather, each person has the nasiha, the way of sincerity that is appropriate to them. For the waliul amr, that can be obeying them in what is obedience to Allah and not disobedience to Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It can be advising them in private. It can be not criticizing them on the mimbar. Here there's a tanbih, be careful. It's not from the aqidah and the manhaj of the salaf to praise the ruler. Especially not to praise the ruler unrestrictedly. It's not from manhaj al-salaf. And whoever says from manhaj al-salaf doesn't know what the manhaj of the salaf is. And I'm, I have no, I'm not shy to say it, wallahi. Unrestricted praise of the ruler, none of the salaf came with this. Rather, what they came with is holding their tongue back out of wanting good for them and good for the people under them. That's what they came with. As for praising what they do wrong, Praising a Muslim in the first place is, is blameworthy. As for praising a Muslim for doing something wrong, this is aswa wa aswa, worse and worse. As for claiming that the manhaj of the salaf is to praise someone for doing something wrong, for this is a jarima fawq al jarima. It's a crime on top of a crime. Sahih, sometimes the scholars may praise in order to fight against the khawarij. Sahih, that is sahih. They might have praised and said, no, he builds masajid, he does, in order to push back against the khawarij who said he didn't do anything good and he's a kafir and whatever sahih but they didn't bring this Islam doesn't let you praise your brother in who is your brother with you in the masjid how is he going to let you praise now someone who did a crime how is he now going to let you praise a crime in front of everybody and it's, it doesn't it, that's not what Islam brought but Islam brought taking your tongue and holding it and not criticizing people in responsibility in order to bring good for them and good for the people who is under them. That's what Islam came with. What will bring Allah's pleasure? That's what Islam came with. How are you advising them? You're advising them with ilm, with knowledge. You're not advising without knowledge. So the ruler in private, with ilm, the people, the regular Muslim, if it's appropriate, generally speaking, you advise people in private, but it could also be in a gathering, a public gathering, sitting, telling people without, you know, specifically naming names. With ilm. Because without ilm, this nasiha doesn't benefit. It has to be with knowledge. With irshad. Irshad is the type of hidayah which is authentic for the people. And in other words, hidayah is, is two types, right? Hidayah to irshad, hidayah to tawfiq. The guidance of showing someone the right way and the guidance of giving them success to achieve it. Showing people the right way, uh, this is for Allah, and also Allah has given the ability in the creation for us to show people the right thing to do. And as for giving them the success to do it, it's for Allah alone. It's for Allah Azza wa Jal alone. So, Knowledge, you don't give nasiha upon ignorance. Showing people the right way and ihsan towards them, good treatment of them. Good treatment of them. And wallahi, this good treatment of people, 
whether it is the ruler, whether it's the regular person, whether it's the person who's the, in charge of the masjid or the person who's just a regular person who comes and prays in the back of the saf. But you treat them in a good way. You give each one the best advice you can give, the best guidance, the best knowledge. You really want good for them. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. None of you believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And that means you don't take them down in public if that's not the right thing to do. It means that you really genuinely want them to take your advice. So you do everything in your advice that would bring them to accept it. Sahibul khala'iqa bil jusumi wa innama arwahuhum fi manzil fawqani. We'll finish with this. I think we have a couple of minutes before the Adhan of Maghrib. They accompany the creation. And from this is the benefit of mixing with the people. The Prophet ﷺ told us the one who mixes with the people and puts up with their harms is better than the one who doesn't mix with the people and doesn't put up with their harms. If you want to be close to Allah, from the great benefits is actually to mix with the people, even if there are harms in it. To be around people, to be hayin, layin, sahlin, qareeb, near to people, easy going, approachable. But when you do that, is your heart attached to them? You're going around with your, you know, people trying to help this guy and help this person. And, you know, but where is your heart? The heart is attached up there. Your heart is gone. You want what is with Allah, not is with what is with the people. You mix with the people to bring them knowledge and guidance and to be good to them. But you don't mix with them because you want what's in their hands. If you go to advise someone in authority or otherwise, you do so because of what you want from Allah, not because of what you want from the hands of those people. All they're thinking about is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All they want is the reward. They don't want what's in the hands of the people. But they do mix with the people in order to provide nasiha, guidance and knowledge. Last issue before the Adhan of Maghrib. Is it ever a good idea to have al-uzla, to distance yourself from the people? Yes, it can be. But generally speaking, this should be the exception rather than the rule. And it takes place when a person sees that they themselves benefit from being distant rather from being close. Times of fitan times or where a person is sees that look me just being around the people i'm not actually it's not actually helping it's not helping me or them what i need is some time alone to just reset myself generally speaking who benefits from the time alone generally speaking the scholars and the people of knowledge benefit more than the regular people the more any yani the less knowledge you have and the less worship you have the more likely it is you need to be around good people and that's the default Keep yourself patient around the people who worship Allah in the morning and the evening and they yani, want his face subhanahu wa ta'ala. We stop there for Maghrib bi'ithnillahi ta'ala and what we're going to do inshallah ta'ala I think we have, do we have three more? We have three more abiyat left? Four more. Four more. Four more abiyat we have left, inshallah ta'ala. Four more, bi'ithni lahi ta'ala. This one, uh, I'll have to make a note. Remind me on this one. This one has a lot, of, I have a lot of differences in my nuskha on it. But inshallah ta'ala, that's after uh, Salat al-Maghrib. We have four more. And we also have to have a Q&A &A as well. So we do our very best to squeeze it all in for you, inshallah ta'ala. Tafadhal bukhira. Assalamu alaikum. Qala al-Shaykh rahimahullahu ta'ala. ألا بالله دعوت الخلائق والمشاهد كلها خوفا على الإيمان من نقصان. Uh, here in both of the نسخ that I have, uh, so here you have ألا بالله. So the first thing is that in both of the نسخ I have, I have it without ألا بالله, and instead of Da'ut I have Da'awat Da'awatul khala'iqi Kulliha Without the word Al-Mashahid Khawfan ala al-imani min nuqsani I have the same 
So in both of them I have Billahi Da'awatul Khala'iqi Kulliha Khawfan ala al-imani min nuqsani But that's just from ikhtilaf and nusakh yani You get these differences in the different texts Any difference in the different texts Also in this one From the ijazah of the sheikh uh, yani That one of the mashayikh brought Billahi da'awatul khala'iqi kulliha Khawfan ala al-imani min nuqsani Ala kulli hal We can read the English inshallah I think I stopped you for the English Forgive me Verily, it is for Allah and with His aid that I call the, the creation and gathering of people, all of them to Allah, out of fear of the decrease of faith. And here we have, for the sake of Allah, uh, here we have, uh, for Allah and with His help. Any for Allah and with His help. Da'utu or da'wat al khala'iqi kulliha. Khawfan ala al imani min nuqsani. The Shaykh himself explains this. He said, Hadihi manzilatu al ri'aya li haqa'iq al imani wa mashahid al wa mashahid al ihsan. So in the explanation, he brings the word mashahid, but in the bait, he doesn't bring it. So it, don't, like it comes like that, it comes and goes. Ka'anna shaykh, and Allah knows best, it seems like the shaykh read it slightly differently at different times. Wallahu alam, and maybe some of them are errors, and maybe some of them are areas where the shaykh, from a different class to class or, or sitting to sitting, uh, he changed the, the bait. Wallahu alam, man. The purpose here, he said, is all about... Looking after your iman and achieving the status of ihsan. And he said, this is because it is not correct for you to only review your deeds after having completed them. In other words, what's not good is you start an action, you finish it and then you say, subhanallah, that was a poor prayer. Rather, before you start the prayer, you take yourself to account. And during the prayer, you take yourself to account. And after the prayer, you take yourself to account. If you look at the tafsir of the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu taqu allaha wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad, you will see that the early generations, rahimahumullahu ta'ala, what did they do? They used to judge themselves before doing something. And they used to judge themselves in the middle of doing something. And they used to judge themselves after doing something. So in each of these situations, and with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all your actions that you do, you do it, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The ba here is ba'ul isti'ana, asking Allah's help to complete that action. And all of them happen, everything that you do happens by Allah's help and Allah's aid. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. We mentioned it. Now, when you are now starting an action, you take yourself to account. Why am I doing this action? Ya Aba Abdul Rahman, why did you sit to speak to the people today? Why are you sitting here? Is it because you want to remove ignorance from yourself or is it because you see yourself to be better than the people? So you ask yourself. Then while you're doing the action, Ya Aba Abdul Rahman, what are you doing in this action? Have you changed your intention? When you came to sit for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are you now sitting for the people? And after the action, was it for Allah? Was it done in the best way? You're scared of your iman going down. Your iman is very valuable. It's more valuable than the money you own. And so you guard it more than you would guard the car that you parked outside and you locked it and you made sure that it was locked and you looked after it. You didn't park it in a place where you thought it was going to get damaged. Look how you looked after your car. Look after your iman more than that. To do that, you have to look after your deeds before during and after you do them. And the more deeds you do, 
the stricter you become with yourself, not the easy going. Some people got the wrong way around. So what they did is they thought, the more I do, the more I do, the less I need to be worried. As for Ahlul Ilm, they said, the more I do, the more I need to be worried. And they became even stronger in guarding and looking after their Iman. And in fact, your Iman will go up and down according to how much you take care of it. How much do you care before you do something and during you do something, during you doing something and after doing something. He said, وَمِنْ أَعْظَمِ مَا يَنْبَغِي مُرَاعَاتُهُ فِي الْعَمَلِ مَشْهَدُ الْإِحْسَانِ وَهُوَ الْحِرْصُ عَلَى إِقَاعِ الْعِبَادَةِ بِحُضُورِ قَلْبٍ وَجَمْعِيَتِهِ عَلَى اللَّهِ he said the greatest from the greatest of the things you should be paying attention to in the actions you do is paying attention to whether you have achieved or are achieving ihsan in that action. Is your heart completely present? There's a word, people use it a lot uh, these days. You hear people talking about, uh, do you feel present? Are you, you know, presence? Or do you feel present in this action you're doing. They talk about it in the dunya, and you should try to achieve presence in your action. You, know, you want to be like, you are really there doing it. For us, this is in ibadah. The dunya, it doesn't matter. If you can do it, you do. If you don't, you don't. But in your ibadah, you need to feel present. You need to feel that your heart is there with this ibadah, and that you've gathered all of your concentration and your efforts upon it. And likewise, to think about Allah's blessings upon you and to show gratitude to Allah because every single good deed that you do is itself a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah Azza wa gave you the ability to do a good deed, this itself is a blessing that deserves gratitude. And if he allowed you to show gratitude, this itself is a blessing that deserves Gratitude, and if he allowed you to show gratitude for the gratitude for the blessing that he gave you, this itself is a blessing that deserves gratitude. So you don't stop showing gratitude for the blessings of Allah and striving to achieve your actions in the best way. Inna Allah katab al ihsana ala kulli shay. Allah has ordained that you perform your deeds in the best possible way. أحسن الله إليكم عزف القلوب عن الشواغل كلها قد فرغوها من سوى الرحمن حركاتهم وهمومهم وعزومهم لله لا للخلق والشيطان They turn the hearts away from all preoccupations They have emptied them from what is beside الرحمن their movements, concerns, and resolutions are for the sake of Allah, not for the crea creation and shaitan. Here, An-Nadhim Rahimahullah Ta'ala goes on to talk about Haqiqatul Zuhd, the reality of Zuhd. Some people think that Zuhd is about leaving the dunya. Sah? Some people think that the word zuhd, abstaining, yani this kind of aestheticism, uh, kind of just le leaving, like leaving the world. Some people think that zuhd is wearing woolen clothing and not getting married and isolating yourself from the people. The first level of zuhd is a zuhd fil haram. Making yourself far away from that which is haram. Abstaining from it. I've got nothing to do with it and it has got nothing to do with me. And that's why from the scholars when they explain the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, from the perfection of a person's faith is leaving what doesn't concern him. The first thing that doesn't concern a believer is doing what Allah made haram. لا يعنيك doesn't concern you you leave it and you abstain from it and you keep yourself away from it and you want nothing to do with it 
But really the greatest example of zuhd is tarku ma la yanfa'u fil akhirah. And this is min ahsani ma qila fi zuhd. From the best of that which is said about what zuhd is, is to leave everything that doesn't benefit you in the akhirah. Now here, if you think about it, it's very different from leaving the haram. The haram is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared to be haram and the Prophet sallallahu declared to be haram is haram and that which the scholars of Islam have come together upon in it being prohibited and, and, and what the evidence and principles suggest. We know what the haram is. Leaving what does not benefit in the akhirah is ihsan because now you are even leaving the mubahat. You're leaving what is halal. You're leaving anything that distracts you from the akhirah. So sometimes a person is sat playing a game. And he said, what I'm playing is not haram. There's no dice involved. There's no haram in it. There's nothing haram happening. I'm not killing people or stealing or cheating. I don't miss my salah. But maybe the first person says, the zuhd. I'm, I'm keeping away from the haram. I left a game that is haram, I left a game that has stealing things, I left a game that had music in it, I left a game that had nudity in it, I left a game that had the dice in it. So I left the haram. We say, you did, you did well, you did well. But better than that, is what you're doing actually benefiting you in the akhirah? If not, leave what doesn't benefit you in the akhirah. And this is haqiqat al-zuhd. تَرْكُ مَا لَا يَنْفَعُ فِي الْأَخِرَةِ عَزَفُ الْقُلُوبَ عَنِ الشَّوَاغِلِ كُلِّهَا They take from their heart everything that busies them from Allah. Whether it is haram or whether it is halal. If it takes them and makes them busy instead of turning to Allah, they leave it. Now what's the difference? If it makes them busy from doing the fard, then this is what is prohibited. If it makes them busy from extra nawafil that they could be doing, then this is leaving that which is permitted because it doesn't benefit you in the akhirah. There's more to say about it if you want more details about it. I did a, a, a long discussion of it in the, there's on U, AMAU YouTube. That's the institute that I teach at Al-Madrasatul Umariyah, AMAU. You can go to their YouTube channel and there's a, a section on, there's a class which is on the YouTube, not in the academy. And it's called something like Tazkiyatun uh, Nafs, Purification of the Soul. So in it we discuss the reality, there's a whole lecture on zuhd and what does it mean. But from the best of that which is said is, Tarku ma la yanfa'u fil akhirah. Anything that is not actually moving you forward in this journey, Drop it. You're now climbing a mountain. Sure, you can climb a mountain with a heavy backpack. That's true. But you're making work hard for yourself. Drop everything that is not benefiting you in that goal that you have. Any dead weight in that backpack that you're carrying, anything that is not strictly needed to get to the top of that mountain, drop it. That's what the reality of zuhd is. So the zahid leaves that which is haram and the zahid leaves that which is halal if it's not going to benefit him in his journey to Allah. And that's why the people who thought that zuhd was leaving marriage, they made a mistake in that. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, مِنِّي, I marry women so whoever turns away from my sunnah, is not one of me. Why? Because what did they do? This marriage was something that will benefit them in the akhirah. It will keep them away from the haram. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. It will make them nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will give them a partner to help them get near to Allah. So when they left it thinking that was zuhd, the Prophet ﷺ rebuked them for it. Because zuhd can only be in these things. Either you're leaving the haram or you're leaving the halal because it doesn't benefit you. As for the halal which benefits you, or the mustahabbat, the recommended actions which benefit you in the akhirah, 
those are not from the things that the Muslim or a sa'ir ilallah should leave. They leave the things that disturb and busy themselves. Their hearts are emptied of everything besides the most merciful. They are single-minded. If you want to be fast on this road, you want to successfully navigate this journey and this path to Allah, you have to be very single-minded. Doesn't mean, we're not saying you have to leave everything in, the, in your whole life. You can have something from it. But you have to be ruthless with yourself in what busies you from, the, from, the, from Allah and the Dar al-Akhirah. You have to be absolutely ruthless with yourself. Be so merciful to the people, but with yourself, you have to be ruthless with yourself. If something is distracting you from the Akhirah, whether it is from the Mubahat, or whether it's from the Haram, if it's from the Haram, that's Awla. You, min babi Awla, you have to leave it. If it's from the Mubahat, if you can leave it in any way, leave it. Wallah, you will see from the Salaf al-Salih, al-Ajaib in this issue. The strangest things. You will see from them, those people, who the only food they used to eat was crumbled bread dipped in soup. Why? He said, it's the quickest way I can put the food in my mouth so I can get on with my ibadah. Everything else takes too long to chew. I don't take whole pieces of bread because it just takes too much of my time to chew it. You see, subhanAllah, people reach a level of so much freeing themselves of anything which distracts them from the Akhirah. Now we're not saying necessarily that people need to go all of them down that route because not all of the early generations did. It's not fair to say that the Sahaba, all of them did that. Or, like in the examples are there to motivate you to think, look, if this person can leave whole pieces of bread because it delays him, there's a lot of things we should be leaving that is a lot bigger than issues of eating whole pieces of bread. There's a lot of things in our lives that are very big distractions. And in reality, you or your heart only really has space for one unwavering commitment. It has space for desires and likes and whatever, but really it, when it comes down to it, one thing has to supersede everything and rule over everything in your heart. You can't have two things. It's like two twins can't come out at the same time. You've got to put one thing, has got to go before the other. And so if it is the Akhirah that goes first and the dunya comes second, that's how we want to be. Our Akhirah is first. Our dunya, well, whatever, whatever's there for me when I'm not too busy with the Akhirah, Alhamdulillah, we'll take it. So we take it. We have jobs. We have professions. We have things we have to do. From the ways that you can help to do this, is to bear in mind the idea of al ihtisab expecting the reward from Allah Azza wa Jalla. And this is in the second bait. Harakatuhum wa humuhum wa uzumuhum lillahi la lil khalqi wa shaytani. Their movements, their humum, what busies them and preoccupies them, and their determination and resolution is all for Allah, not for the creation and the shaytan. So these people, even the mubahat that they do, the halal that they do, they do it thinking about the akhirah. Let's give an example. Let's give an example. A person has to, has to work. You have to get a job, right? Especially for the men, you get a job, you provide for your family. So he has a job. By Allah's help and permission, he spends on his family. While he's doing that job, what's in his mind? I'm doing this for Allah so that I can fulfill my obligation to my family and please Allah by spending upon them and giving them food as Allah wills and Allah as Allah helps me to do. Then he gets reward for it. The lady, for example, let's just say she's, she's at home and she's taking care of the house and, and everything and the kids. In her mind, is she saying, I'm losing out. I should be a career woman. I should be at the top of my profession. She said, I'm doing this for Allah. I left being that career woman for Allah so that Allah will reward me for fulfilling my rights to my family 
and so that Allah will be pleased for me for what, what I did. And so Allah rewards her for cleaning the house, washing the dishes. She's washing the dishes and Allah is re rewarding her, giving her ajr for it. Because everything that the Muslim does is just one single-minded, the akhirah. Does that mean that you don't have humum in the dunya? It doesn't. There's a hadith. ضَعَفَهُ بَعْضُ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ وَحَسَّنَهُ بَعْضُهُمْ وَفِيهِ ضَعْفِ لَكِنْ جَاءَ مَا يَشْهَدُ لَهُ There's a hadith which is, has a weakness in it. Some of the ulama declare it to be hasan. Lakin it has a weakness in it, but it has that which testifies for it. And that is the statement which is attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مَنْ جَعَلَ الْهُمُومَ هَمَّا وَاحِدًا هَمَّا آخِرَتِهِ كَفَاهُ اللَّهُ هَمَّا دُنْيَاهُ وَأُخْرَى وَمَنْ تَشَعَبَتْ بِهِ الْهُمُومَ فِي أُمُورِ الدُّنْيَا لَمْ يُبَالِ اللَّهُ فِي أَيِّ أَوْدِيَتِهَا هَلَكَ Whoever makes their intention, their worry, their preoccupation, one thing that they're preoccupied with, and that is being preoccupied with the Akhirah. In some of the narrations, Hem al Ma'ad, the worry about the resurrection, the return to Allah. Allah will take care of your worries in this dunya. You're allowed to have worries in this dunya. You worry about your family, you worry about your rent, you worry about bills, you worry about money, you worry about sickness, you worry about things. But those things are just tiny in comparison to your worry about the Akhirah. Allah will take care of all your worries in this world. And if you allow yourself for your worries to be divided among the matters of the dunya, Allah does not care in which valley you die. In other words, which thing will destroy you? Is it going to be family destroys you? Is it going to be the wealth that destroys you? Is it going to be your health that destroys you? Is it going to be your children that destroys you? It doesn't matter to Allah. You have to make your primary concern for Allah. Even your concern in this dunya, what is motivating you? Why are you scared about your rent and your bills? Because you have a family, you have to look after them, it's a right of them. You, Allah can question you about whether you fulfilled that right or you didn't. Everything you worry about is in the context of the akhirah. And as for the natural worries of the dunya, those natural worries are very insignificant and small in comparison to what you worry about the akhirah. But if you allow yourself to be consumed by the worries of the dunya, one or the other is going to bring about your destruction and it doesn't matter. This hadith, as we said, fihi da'af, it has a weakness in it, except that it has what testifies to it from a number of other hadith. If you bring together a large number of other hadith, you find the same meaning is found in a collection of many other hadith. I brought it in Bab al-Ikhtisar just to summarize. But otherwise, the meanings are found in the ayat of the Quran and the hadith which came with the same, the same concept as that. Make your concern the concern of the akhirah and don't make your primary concerns the concerns of the dunya and your determination and your resolution. Why is it? Why are you so motivated and so passionate? For what? So you can be rich. I mean, how much of that will you carry your Qiyamah? When you get resurrected, are you, you're not even going to be resurrected with shoes. You're not even going to be resurrected with clothes. What is all that money going to do for you? The richest man in the face of this world is going to be resurrected naked and barefooted and uncircumcised. Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So what good did it bring you? It brought your family good after you pass away. Your inheritors get happy. Like in Sarah, it didn't bring you except what good you did with it for Allah. So I'm not saying to want poverty. I'm not. I'm saying want the akhirah from what Allah has given you. <laughs> and from the greatest of the things that you should have determination for and dedication for is talab al-ilm, al-shari'i, al-ilm al-nafi'i, seeking beneficial knowledge of the sharia. And this should be one of your greatest goals and aims that keeps you awake at night it keeps you busy in the day. And don't allow your actions, your movements, your preoccupy, the things that preoccupy your mind 
and your determination don't allow them to become for people in creation. Wallahi, this is a beautiful piece of advice. Don't allow yourself to become enslaved to people and the shaitan. Ibn al-Qayyim said something in his Nuniya. It was Ibn al-Qayyim this time. Profound, wallahi. He said, Harabu min they ran away from the slavery they were created for and they became slaves to themselves and the shaitan. They ran away from being slaves to Allah. Allah gave them the highest position a person can achieve in this world and yakuna abadan lillah. Maqam al-ubudiyah. The status of being a servant and a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they ran away from servitude to Allah, they said, we want freedom, we want liberty, we want justice, we want to be free to do whatever we want. So these people, what did they become? Did they become free? They became enslaved, worse than the slavery they ran away from. They became slaves to the nafs and to the nafs of the other people. And they became slaves to the shaitan. Let me give you an example. The Muslim woman is constantly being bombarded, being told that, sister, you need to be free. You need to be liberated from these chains. They put this blanket over you from your head to your foot and they lock you up in this prison and they chain you up. You need to be free. The day that she takes it off, she walks among the people. Wallahi, she's not free. She became a slave, not to Allah, but she became a slave to the desires of people. She wears what she wears because people, what will people think of her? What will people look at her? She wears what she wears because it's attractive to men. She became a slave to men instead of being a slave to Allah. And she became a slave to the shaitan instead of becoming a slave to Allah. Ya Ikhwan, you are a slave. La mahala, you can't, you know, don't try to get away from me. Men, women, you are a slave. Either be a slave with honor to Allah or be a slave with dishonor to the people. But you cannot get out from it. You will never be free. You are a slave either to Allah or either to the people. So decide who do you want to be a slave to? Young men, how many people are affected by peer pressure? Your friends are telling you to do things. Allah, be a slave to Allah, don't be a slave to them. Be a shepherd, don't be a sheep. You should be the one that is walking in front of the people. وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama, An example for the people of taqwa. But instead you're walking behind. أَتْبَاعُ كُلِّ نَائِقْ Everyone who shouts out, makes a noise, you walk behind them. Every fashion the kuffar develop, you go behind it. Every evil, foolish thing they do, you're the second, third one to do it. So you become like Ali ibn Abi Talib said, Atba'u kulli na'iq. Everyone who cries out, you walk behind them. Instead of being the one that the people walk behind as an example for the righteous. So you have a choice. Either you're a slave to Allah, either you're a slave to your nafs or a slave to the shaitan. So don't be a slave to the shaitan. There's nothing good in it. Not in the dunya, nor in the akhirah. And don't be a slave to the people. Don't let people dictate to you what you do. In the sense of dictating to you to, to turn away from your religion and pushing you and pressurizing you to do it and telling you you can be free. I don't want to be free. You want to be free? Go do what you want. I'malu ma shaitum. Do whatever you want if you want to be free. But wallahi, I want to be a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is the highest status a person can be. The evidence for this, Subhanalladhi asra bi abadihi laylan min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa ladhi barakna hawla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Exalted is the one who took his slave from the masjid al haram to the masjid al aqsa that we blessed around it. The most blessed journey the Prophet ﷺ ever went upon. 
was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him to the highest place. He took him beyond where Jibreel is allowed. Jibreel said, this is my place. I'm not allowed beyond here. You go, I cannot go. And what did Allah call him in the highest place that anyone from creation has ever been? Subhanallah, asra bi abadihi, my slave. So to be a slave of Allah is the highest status a person can be. To be a slave to the other people is a very low position. And to be a slave to the shaitan is aswa. It's worse to be a slave to, to the shaitan. Ahsanallahu ilaykum. Ni'mar rafiqu li talib al-subul al-lati tufdi ila al-khayrat wal-ihsani. How excellent a companion for the seeker of the paths which lead to goodness and benevolence. Here and in this last line, inshallah ta'ala, with which we're going to stop, the author speaks about the excellence of a companion or companions on this path, the path to Allah and the paths which lead to goodness, and the paths which lead to Ihsan. He said, فَهَاُولَاءِ هُمُ الَّذِينَ يَسْعَدُ بِهِمْ رَفِيقُهُمْ إِذَا اقْتَدَى بِسُرُوكِ سَيْرِهِمْ فَرِيقُهُمْ He said, these people, I, what has been mentioned in the, in the, what has been mentioned in the poem, the people that we've been talking about, these are the people you should make your companions. And we've spoken about the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا How excellent is it to have the people on the same path as you, that you're walking in their footsteps. They're the prophets. They are those people at the highest standard of faith, of truthfulness in faith. The martyrs and the righteous, the Sahaba, and those who followed them in good. And how excellent is it to walk in their footsteps? And how important is it that you choose companions who match this description? SubhanAllah, if you think about the ayat that came in the Quran, the ayat that came in the Quran about friendship. The statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَيَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا يَا وَيْلَتَا لَيْتَنِ لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا لَقَدْ أَضَلَّنِي عَنِ الذِّكْرِ بَعْدَ إِذْ جَاءَنِي وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا on the day when the oppressive person will bite on their hands. Out of despair, they will actually bite on their own hands. Out of despair. When someone is in so much despair, they bite on their own hands. You will say, how I wish I took away with the Rasul. The way of the Rasul. The way of as-sa'irina ilallahi wa dar al-akhirah. The people who are journeying to Allah in the dar al-akhirah. How I wish I didn't take this person as my friend. This person took me away from the dhikr after it came to me. And the shaitan is always in a state where he abandons and betrays the human being. So from this, wallahi, we can see, and from what we mentioned earlier, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ Keep yourself in a state of patience with those people, the good people. The Prophet ﷺ is being told, keep yourself around people who remember Allah in the morning and the evening. If the Prophet ﷺ needs good companionship, we are far more deserving of needing good companionship. Make sure the friends you choose are the friends who are walking on the path to Allah, journeying to Allah in the Dar al Akhirah, who are moving forwards in that endeavor and in that path, not the people who are holding you back and not the people who are taking you onto the subul, the paths that take you away from the path of Allah. 
That is what Allah Azza wa Jal made easy for us to mention. In reality, as you can see, it's a very, very beneficial point. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon the author. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward him with the best of rewards. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him and us from the people of Al-Firdaus Al-A'la min Al-Jannah, the highest place in Jannah, ma'an nabiyyina wa siddiqina wa shuhada'i wa salihin, along with the prophets, those people truthful in faith, the martyrs and the righteous. We ask Allah to teach us what benefits us, to benefit us with what he teaches us. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give us the ability to practice it and implement it. Jazakum Allahu khayran wa barakallahu feekum. Wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een.